Hello, my name is Bernard Fleming. Where and when were you born? I was born in Springfield, Massachusetts, 1922, November 5th. So how old are you right now? Right now, I am 97. Do you feel like you're 97? No. No. Oh, I feel a little younger. Physically, you know, what, what's it like to be 97, sir? Well, being 97, most of the time I'm sitting. I can't do what I would like to do, and I can't go out like I used to go out. And I used to work uh, uh, outside around the house, the grass and flowers. And, and tell me, Mr. Fleming, for the record, what specific units were you a part of during your time overseas? I, I was with the 45th, 157th Infantry, 3rd Battalion, Headquarters, Anti-Tank. What was your specific job in the uh, Anti-Tank Platoon? Well, I worked up from being a private, which was like loading the, the we had 57 millimeter anti-tank guns. And uh, I become a corporal and worked up to platoon sergeant. Uh, and what was the highest rank you achieved by the time you left the service? I was a tech sergeant. Oh. And if you could just state for the record, where were the major areas that you saw action in? What countries? Uh, I would say Italy, be uh, the Venifro Mountains, and uh, Anzio in Italy was uh Anzio was the worst. Uh, then uh, the southern France making the landing in southern France was a, a scary one, but it wasn't really bad because we had no heavy fighting making the landing. And after that, we had Reaper's Wilders, and we had Epinal, France, and we went from Epinal to Aschassenburg, and then from there to Nuremberg, and then uh, from Nuremberg we went uh, to Dachau. And from Dachau, we went to Munich, the war was over. Yeah. So before we go further into your war experiences, I want to backtrack, sir. You mentioned you were born in Springfield. Right. Did you grow up there? Oh, yes. Uh, I grew up there and uh, till, uh, well, I lived in Springfield even after I got married in Springfield and lived there and uh, raised our four children there. Talk, talk to me about growing up there. What kind of things did you do for fun as a kid? Oh, as a kid, uh, of course, it was during the Depression. So uh, we had a, 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 if we had a baseball team, there'd be only one, one of the players would have a glove and we'd pass it around. And, uh, of course, where we lived, there was a woods around, and we used to go down the woods, and there was a stream in the woods. And uh, we used to have a fire down there to have a, a, um, baked potatoes. We Everyone bring an own potato and put it in a fire, and we uh, bake them like that. We climbed trees, and there's one tree that had uh, crab apples on, 
We used to climb up and grab, get the crab apples. And of course, there was fields of blueberries and strawberries where we would go out and pick them. And uh, we, uh, we used to pick quite a few of them, bring them home. And my mother and grandmother used to make uh, jelly. And we and in our backyard we had a a home garden where every day we worked worked out in the home garden and we grew uh, tomatoes, carrots, and uh, corn and straw uh, not strawberries. The strawberries were wild. We used to pick them wild. Elderberries we used to pick wild too. My father used to make elderberry wine and uh, we had a, a grapevine that you could sit under and we had conquer grapes and uh, but we uh, we used to play down uh, sandlot baseball we'd have one base baseball it was like a nickel rocker we used to call them and then used to split open and be just uh, old rags or something inside of them. And we used to tape them up with black tape. And we had one baseball bat for each team. <laughs> and uh, we made our own sports. And we played baseball, we played football, and we uh, played basketball. The, the city used to open up the schools for, uh, I think, like WPA or something like that, uh, where we we could go there at, uh, after dinner and play basketball at night. Uh, we made up our own sports, but we uh, nobody had a car and nobody had. Uh, most everybody around was on welfare ex except for our our family. My father refused to go on at welfare. Uh, he was an engineer on a railroad, but he was laid off, and he worked in a, a box company, a cardboard box company that made uh, up an Indian orchard, shoveling coal in the boilers up there during the Depression. But everybody lived about the same. We had to make our own teams up and play, and walk everywhere or run everywhere. But nobody had anything other than that. And there was only one person in the whole neighborhood that had a car. Uh, that's, that's a part of life. When you and your buddies would get together when you were teenagers, what what kind of mischief uh, would you and your buddies get into? Oh, we, we, uh, well, we uh, well that if one of teenagers we uh, things started picking up as far as work goes for other people, and uh, uh, we used to uh, have uh, semi semi-pro baseball teams that played on them. And um, one of the teams I was on, we won the championship, was a trip to uh, Boston to the Red Sox game. That was the award. And then afterwards, they used to take the bus to um, an Italian restaurant in Springfield, and we'd have uh, dinner. Uh, that was uh, our award for winning a championship. Uh, and, and tell me the story. Uh, from my understanding, you saw a famous baseball player. Uh, seen, uh, when we went to Boston, they, at that time, it was at the end of Babe Ruth's career. The Yankees let him go, I guess. And he went and played with the Boston Braves. There used to be a baseball team in Boston, Boston Braves, and he played on that team, and we went there, and we seen him play there in his last, last years that he played baseball. 
what was that like to see Babe Ruth in person playing? Well, we were still kids, uh, but uh, it, w it was great because uh, not many people have seen him. <laughs> but, uh, of course, he was still a big name ball player. But it, it was at his end of his career. And um, we, I also seen uh, Robert Moranville. Uh, he was a... Uh, brought up in the same area where my father was brought up. So my father knew who he was, and, he, and my father used to play with him when they were kids. But uh, that was, that's about the story of it. And, and uh, tell me, how did you hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Uh, oh, this friend of mine, Bud Garvey, and I, uh, we, we were both working from uh, after uh, graduated school. I was, I was um, 18 or 19, uh, and um, we went to the movie at Lowell's Paul Ives Theater in Springfield. And we come out, and of course, being big shots that we were, because we both had jobs, we got a taxi to take us home. And uh, when we were in the taxi, the taxi driver told us that, about Pearl Harbor. That's how we knew it, a taxi from a taxi driver. What was that like, Mr. Fleming, as a young man, to hear that your country had been attacked? It, it was uh, very surprising, really. And, uh, of course, everybody was surprised. But uh, the following days, all the fellows that hang out with and everything, we were all, even I went down, to register for the draft. Uh, there was no draft then. Uh, but to register to go in the service, and there were big lines in Springfield to, to people signing up for the, uh, the service. And I, I went home, I told my mother what I did, and she says, <laughs> I was uh, 18, and she says, uh, you're not going. <laughs> I said, why? And uh, am I, of course, her brother, my uncle, was killed in World War I. And she says, you are not going. And, and I respected my mother very, very much. And I said, all right, I won't go. Because I knew in time I was going to be drafted. So I, I wouldn't do anything to get her upset. Uh, You're doing wonderful. Uh, so take me through. Uh, what happens then? You know, when do you get drafted? And oh, I, I graduated from school, and I wanted to be an electrician, but uh, nobody would hire a, 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 a anyone at my age because of the fact that they knew that in in a, a month or so you'd be drafted, and then it, and they'd be uh, trying to look for somebody else. So I went to work at the American Bosch in Springfield, manufacturing parts for uh, in, engines uh, that Pratt and Whitney uh, uh, sublet to the American Bosch, and I worked there. And I got my notice, uh, maybe in six months or so, to report to a, for a physical on Springfield. And, and so after your draft, to take me through the process of oh, uh, after uh, the draft, I got uh, you get a postal card. I used to have it. I don't. I don't think I have it now. 
Uh, I used to have a card that says that you were rated A1, which means that you go into the service. And then I was notified as going into the service. And we went down to um, a building on Main Street in Springfield on the fourth floor where a doctor is supposed to examine, well, examine you to see if you're qualified to be drafted or to go in. And it, it, which to me, to this, even to this day, was a big joke because uh, there was about 10 of us in a room sitting in chairs in a row. And he come down and look at your feet, walk behind you, look at your back. And uh, then he had to stand up and look at a chart on the wall. And we were very close to the chart. Nobody could, anyone, even a blind man could have read it. <laughs> and uh, they, the doctor went in another room, and there was two uh, National Guard men that were there that were supposed to oversee us. And uh, it came out and said, okay, everybody can go. That was our physical for the service. And we went, and we got a card in the mail, or like a postal card, that says, you qualified as A1, meaning you could be drafted. And they, so uh, it wasn't too long after that I received a notice that I was drafted. Uh, and so uh, take me through your induction and where they go, where you go for training. Oh, I, I, got, I received a notice to report to, um, uh, it's a, sm a small, vacant store uh, building. And we went in there, and there was maybe 12 of us from all over western part of the state, uh, New Hampshire uh, and the, the New England states. And um, we sat on chairs there, and these two... National Guard sergeants, they were older, so they, 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 that's what they were doing, just recruits. And we sat in chairs, and then these two civilian men came in, and they were on the draft board, and gave, they gave a little talk. And then when this officer came in, army officer came in, we had to stand up, raise our right hand for a oath of office. And then we were marched. Uh, this, this was on the other side, uh, on the side of the post, main post office in Springfield. And on the other side was the railroad station. So we were marched from that, that building around the post office into the railroad station. And we were sitting in a special section in a railroad station and told not to uh, disappear, go away or something. And uh, so while we were there, my grandfather was the train caller there. So I seen him and I went over and I talked to my grandfather for a while and then uh, we got the call that the, our troop train was, came in, and we were marched up and brought into a, one of the cars. Some of the cars were filled because it's, they started in Boston, and they stopped in Worcester, and they stopped in Springfield and picking up. And then, then when we left Springfield, they stopped in uh, New Haven, uh, uh, Hartford, and then when we went to New Haven, Bridgeport, into a staging area for the trains in uh, New York, waiting for a train coming from the, uh, the west coast, or the west part of the country, and made a big, long troop train. 
And then, then we, got, we left there and traveled all night long. They, they gave us uh, a bag with a sandwich in and a cup of coffee on a train. That was our, uh, that was our meal. Uh, and uh, we, in the uh, early in the morning, we started hitting the southern states, and we got to uh, South Carolina, right into the camp, Camp Cross, South Carolina. And we unloaded there, and we lined up alongside outside the train. And I don't know if it was an officer or listed uh, sergeant that stood up on a platform calling your name and you reported to a certain section. And after everybody was lined up there, we were marched to a barracks. Or we uh, lined up outside the barracks and our names were called and we go in the barracks and we're given a stand up next to a bed there. That's how I, that started my military career, really. Your memory is amazing. You have, you have an excellent memory. Um, take me through a typical day of basic training at Camp Cross. Basic training? Uh, well, the, the first thing they did, we lined up and we were marched to a barber shop. Even the fellows with mustaches or beards, or uh, they all got their GI haircut, and the mustaches were off and everything. And then we were taken to this um, quartermaster building where um, we received our uniforms, we were lining up, and they check you over and you know, the sizes and everything and the shoes and everything. And we go back and we were told to put on our uh, army fatigues. And uh, we could, uh, oh, uh, and then the, uh, the, the sergeant and his assistant, a corporal, Come out. We had a sergeant at Dam Damsky, a very, very good man, and a good sergeant. Uh, he come out, and he says, "I'm gonna." Sh we had to stand around this one cot, and they sh made a bed and showed us how to make a bed, and we all had to make beds like that. And uh, you could never. Once uh, you start uh, get up in the morning, you made your bed. You could not sit on your bed at any time. You had to sit on it. We had a, tr a trunk at the end of the bed where everything else was in. And we could sit on the trunk, but you couldn't sit on your bed. And your bed had to be made just right, or the corporal would come by and he'd rip it apart. you have to start over again and make your bed up again. And uh, then we were issued rifles, and, and each rifle had a serial number, and you had to remember your serial number. And uh, it, it's in a rifle rack outside, out in the bed. And uh, everything was, we get called out to go to breakfast. Then we go to uh, do calisthenics, and then we go back in and wash up a little, and then we start training, taking us down an obstacle course, and every day we had to do exercise and then they started we started going to the rifle range and one day you, you'll go to where we throw grenades and then we had an optical course we had to go under we had to 
I don't, I don't know how high the barbed wire was from the ground, but we had to crawl underneath with our, our, our rifles. Uh, uh, so many, I don't know how, how far we had to crawl, but we had to crawl on it. If you got up, you, the barbed wire would grab you on your jacket or something. And then we'd have uh, marching, and then we'd go to the, the firing range, uh, which I enjoyed very much. I liked shooting. And uh, then one day we went to another range where we had machine guns. And we were firing machine at, at these targets away out, and uh, oh, then we had bayonet practice, and but uh, uh, do a lot of uh, walking, a lot of walking, and the final day of uh, training, or the, or the day before. Uh, we had an all night long walk. We started at, say, at six o'clock, and when, uh, about seven o'clock in the morning, we, we'd, we would be headed back towards the barracks. And in the last, maybe, you know, a couple hundred yards or something like that, there was a band playing. Uh, that, that the end of the walk. Then we went back to the barracks, and we, we uh, cleaned up, and went for breakfast, and then we were told that uh, we're, we're going to get uh, I don't know seven day pass or something like that to go home. Our training was over with. And uh, we we went. Uh, I had enough money just to get the ticket on a train to get home, <laughs> uh, because we were only getting twenty dollars a a month. And and uh, this fellow George Welgus, I never forget him. He he lived in. Uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, he didn't have any money. He went to the Red Cross and asked for some money, and they gave him some money to get home on. And the funny part there was, uh, I'll never forget. We, he was on, a, we used to sleep together on Anzio for a while. We were in, in the same squad. Uh, he, he he said he said to me one day he says hey Fleming and I said what's the matter and he says read this and he got a bill from the Red Cross for the money that he, they gave him at the training to get home he says what'll I do with it and I says send him a letter back or a note back and say. I have the money for you. I don't want to mail it to you. Please send somebody here. And, you'll get, and he did. He said, you never heard from him again after that. <laughs> but. Uh, That's some nerve of them to send yeah. it all the way to Anzio. Yeah. Uh, they were asking for the money. But the money is donated to them. We were treated better by the Salvation Army. Uh, when we were boarding his ships to go to, uh, well, we didn't know we were going to Af Africa, but um, we thought we were going to England. But uh, when we were boarding boarding the ships, uh, the Salvation Army was at the, the bottom of the ship, giving us things. I forget what they gave us, but they gave us things there. The Red Cross never gave us anything. They they wanted things, but they never gave them to the, to the, as far as I know, they never did. Even today, all yeah. they keep talking about is blood and blood and blood. They yeah. get all they want. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but uh, I remember he got a bill from them. And uh, 
And the funny part is, my son is, uh, what is he, uh, he's, um, works for the Red Cross. Uh, uh, he goes to these disasters and things like that. And uh, I said, I never donated to them and I never will since the, the, what they left me in the war. Because we were in this village in, in Italy and we're s sitting on a wall. We just took the village of the wall. Uh, uh, oh, maybe a few hours before, but um, we were sitting on the wall, the, our, our, our unit, just waiting for orders, and this army truck came in, and they had uh, drove into the center of the compound, and it's kept with two GIs in the truck. They come out and they lift up the flap of the back of the truck and lower the tailgate and put like a ladder going up into the truck. And so one of the fellows went over and said, what, they, what are you doing? And he says, the Red Cross is gonna give uh, donuts and, uh, oh, oh uh, s s stew to the people. He says, so the, the two of them, uh, the, he says, we have to wait for the Red Cross to show up. So the two of them were going around and they telling the people to line up that lived there. And the people formed a line and they waited a half hour before this Jeep pulled up. And there was two Red Cross um, ladies in the Jeep and a, a, a soldier driving the Jeep, chauffeuring her. And they went on, got up the tailgate of the truck. Oh, another Jeep came after that. And the guy had a camera. And uh, they got up the, the, the tailgate, they had these big ladles of things, and the people had pots, and they give them a ladle of soup in it. And they did only two people like that. And then they got down, got in the Jeep and took off. And the two fellows that drove, that drove there gave the, started giving the food out to the people. So that, that's, uh, that's why I had no, no, I have no love for the Red Cross. Although I am a gallon blood donor. <laughs> I don't know blood, <laughs> but I, I would I never give him any money or, or anything like that, uh, and even though my son works for him. And, uh, so I just want to backtrack, sir. Uh, after your training completed, you know, take me through how did you actually get overseas? Where, um, where did you? What was the port of embarkation? Uh, uh, there was after training. Uh, like I said, we had to leave at home. We come back to, to, to uh, uh, Spartanburg, uh, where the camp, Camp Croft, and we were told to pack our things up. And uh, we only spent one day back at Camp Croft. And the next morning, we had our duffel bags and we were brought to a, a, the railroad station in the camp and we boarded a train and we went to um, Camp uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama. And uh, the, uh, of course, it was afterwards they found out why, why we went there because we went there in, into a barracks and they used to take us out to a peanut farm, or you know, they grew peanuts, and uh, we we were we were um, out in a peanut farm, and uh, and all we do was sit out amongst the the plants because the peanuts were just starting to grow, 
and and uh, it was just to get us out of camp. And well, we went back to camp. We were only there maybe a week, and we packed our clothes, clothes up again, our, our duffel bags, and we were told not to put any personal belongings in the duffel bags, only your uniforms. And uh, so, of course, the personal uh, things weren't very much anyway. So you, the only thing you put in your pockets. So, uh, because we all had army clothes and everything. And um, we, we boarded a train at Camp, Camp Rutgers, and we headed to Newport News, Virginia, right to the dock. We got to the dock, we un unloaded with our duffel bags uh, out of the, the train and lined up, and we marched to the gangplank. And we walked up the gangplank. We were told to leave our duffel bags at the top when we get there. And there was, uh, must have been deck hands on the ship. They take them and they were throwing them down into a hole. And we we were marched in and told to get into another hole that in the ship. And there was. Uh, Cock, cox, uh, uh, let's see, one, two. I think there was three, three uh, beds, uh, you know, sleeping, one, one on, it, and, um, and it, all, it was only just enough aisle where if, if two people were going by each other, they'd have to squeeze to get by. It, the whole place was filled up with the fellows being transported overseas. And uh, we uh, we got two meals a day on board, I'll never forget. Uh, at eight o'clock in the morning, we got uh, oatmeal, one slice of toast, and a cup of coffee. At four o'clock in the afternoon, We'd get stew, one slice of bread, and a cup of coffee. That was, that's what we got for 22 days that we were on that ship. Every day was the same thing. Now, they had a crew of Coast Guardmen that, were, uh, that manned uh, anti-tank guns on board the ship of both the stern in the back and um, and the crew and you could smell from the galley the food that they were getting and, the guy, and they put a guard on the galley that, so that none of the crew of us could go up there again it's just, but uh, we only, I only slept the first night in fact, there was four of us. Only slept one night in the hold of the ship because once we left the harbor, all we heard at that time, the Germans had uh, those um, submarine fleets out there. And, and all night long, all we heard was depth charges going off. And so the next morning, the four of us got together and we said, we're not going to sleep down in that hole, you know, because there was no way that we could get out of that hole if the uh, it was the ship was torpedoed. Absolutely no way, and because it was a cargo hole that they made into a sleeping quarter, and um, so we took our mattresses, which were only about two inches thick, anyway up on deck and we slept all the way across on on the deck, the fan tail, or is that the back of the deck? Uh, that's where we slept we, uh, on, the, on the deck and we were fortunate. 
we didn't have one rainy day. Uh, but uh, all night long you hear the death charges going on. And uh, it took us, and when we got a cer certain miles from England, the convoy split up. It was a huge, all, all, all you could see was ships all the way around. Uh, the convoy split up. Some went to England and we went to the Mediterranean. And uh, we, we landed in uh, Arzu, uh, I think, uh, uh, North Africa, Arzu. Uh, once we landed in uh, uh, Africa, uh, we got off the ship onto trucks and we were brought out to a, a area where there was uh, tents. And there was, um, I believe there was uh, six of us to a tent. And uh, we, we were told nothing about it, but uh, there was one, uh, show that went on, the, the movie stars that were act, acting in them. And where we uh, lined up for, to eat, to receive, uh, it was Italian prisoners of war were dishing out the food. And, and uh, it didn't take long for the fellows that understood Italian and spoke Italian to keep their mouths shut because every one of the ones that was serving had a brother or a cousin or somebody in the United States. And they were prisoners. And they were treated better than we were in there. And uh, we had these masks similar to what we're, we're wearing here now because of dust storms. And... Uh, here we are with these masks covering our nose and our mouth and everything because of the dust. And um, we had open trays to eat on, so the food was getting covered with the dust. And in some cases, were, you see fellows with like mud coming out of this. So, but uh, we used to go under, underneath the trucks or anywhere to get out of the way while we're reading it. But the, that happened, we were only there, we were assigned, uh, I, like I was assigned to the 45th Division, 157th Regiment, and 3rd, 3rd Battalion. And we went, uh, we were there maybe three or four days. And we went aboard, uh, an English ship that used to be a passenger ship, and we were treated wonderful aboard that ship. They, uh, we, we received the same food that the crew of the ship received. And um, we even had, they had a tea break, the, the, the English did, and when they got tea, we got tea. And where we slept was hammocks, like o over where the mess halls were. And you unstring your hammock and hang it up, and that's where you slept. And when you got up in the morning, you unhooked the hammocks again so they could have breakfast and like that. And we received the three meals a day aboard there that were really good. And uh, everybody used to say, the United States should take lessons from them <laughs> because the food was excellent. And, uh, you know, compared to, to what we got aboard the, the United States ships. And, uh, and of course, we got the, the tea break and we got, uh, and they had these, they call them biscuits, but little crackers. Right? 
and uh, we 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 even had them. So it worked out real well, and we landed in uh, uh, not uh, Naples. As soon as we landed in Naples, uh, they had us as a sign, and they called your name, and you board a certain truck, and I did. And this friend of mine, George Welgus, he was out uh, with me too, and we were taken to a or, or the bivouac area of the 45th, 3rd Battalion that we went, and we were assigned anti-tank crew. And that's really when uh, the war started for me, uh, right there. Uh, so, I mean, you joined as a replacement. The 45th had seen action in Sicily. They were part of the invasion of Italy. Yeah. When you first joined 3rd Battalion, uh, the anti-tank platoon, what, what advice or what did some of the combat veterans tell you about what you could expect about fighting the enemy? Actually, they didn't say, say anything, really. Uh, and, um, I joined them uh, because uh, there's quite a few replacements there they, they lost uh, they lost men in in uh, Sicily and they lost them crossing over uh, from Sicily to the mainland there that's why they were down in a rest area but we weren't in the rest area too long um, the thing is that uh, the comp uh, the no battalion <laughs> oh uh, the platoon, the anti-tank platoon that I, I joined, the commanding officer, Lieutenant Lafley, lived in Chicopee, which is outside of Springfield. <coughs> and uh, he used to tell everybody he lived in Springfield because nobody heard of Chicopee. <laughs> and Chicopee uh, ended up with a big uh, Westover Field base. And uh, so, uh, anyways, I was assigned to a, 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 a squad where we had a, a 57 million, million in, uh, uh, anti tank guns, and we had. Uh, Six, 60 uh, millimeter machine guns uh, each each uh, we had three three anti-tank guns and and three uh, 60 caliber machine guns uh, uh, in uh, in this platoon and uh, so uh, in Italy we couldn't use the 57 millimeters because we were uh, mountains, we were up in the mountains, Benefro Mountains, so we were riflemen. And uh, of course we had the machine guns. And uh, we used to climb the mountains. You'd be up there so many days, up on the mountains, and then you'd be relieved, you'd go down and you wash up and clean up and uh, try and get some rest and, and get some decent food. And uh, uh, we did that until, um, that was in Venero. <coughs> Excuse me. You want some more water? <coughs> no, I, I'm okay. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, uh, we went down, uh, back one time, and we went. They took us down to Salerno, where we uh, did some training, and got some clean clothes. Oh, they had a portable shower. Uh, you take your clothes off at one end of the tent, and you go in and take a shower. And then they had it timed. <coughs> I gotta have one. 
cartridge belts up with clips and whatever weapon you were carrying. You had to have your extra. And then we had to have grenades. Uh, when, uh, I used to, the straps on the, our packs, I used to stick them on the, on the, to, to hold them there because you had uh, other things to carry. And um, we, marched into uh, the harbor in Naples and boarded the landing crafts. And we went to out in the Mediterranean and, and uh, landed at Anzio. And we, they, they, we got orders to hurry up and get off the beach before the Germans starts. They were shy. Uh, uh, firing on the harbor quite often. And there was only a few buildings that I remember uh, seeing, but every building I seen was damaged. And, and um, so we, we, land, we got off there and landed and got in uh, trucks and brought us out to the area where we were going in. And we got off the trucks, and the trucks got out of there real fast. And we were given a different uh, an area to dig in. Saying say it was this, nobody was advancing. Everybody was just trying, trying to keep that area. Uh, I have to blow my nose. No worries. <laughs> uh, 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 So, do me a favor, before we go full into Anzio, I want to backtrack. Okay. So, can you tell me about, I mean, did you get into combat before Anzio, when you talk about those mountains? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, talk to me about your actual first experience in combat, after you joined the outfit and you guys well, left the rest area, what happened? Well... <clears throat> we were going up this mountain uh, outside of uh, Naples. It, it was a, I believe it was the whole battalion that was going up. And I don't know whereabouts in the line we were, but uh, it's it, it zigzagging uh, up the mountain. Uh, you don't walk straight up, it's, it's a zigzag. And you can see the troops are up in front of you, away up. And we were down maybe halfway up. And uh, as we were going up, we have a, a break every so often. And we were leaning, uh, sitting down. Uh, and it's not a path or anything, it's just the, the route we were going on. And um, you hear a shot, and uh, everybody looks around. Of course, they know what happened. Somebody shot themselves. They were so scared. It, that happens every so often. And, and, um, and sure enough, uh, as we're going up, the medic was on the side of, the, of where we were walking taking care of this fellow that shot himself. And uh, nobody blamed him uh, or, or said he was a coward or anything. He was so scared, that's why he, he did it. And, uh, and, and some of the fellows would say uh, uh, he had more nerve than we did because he says, I wouldn't even think of shooting myself. And so it it would take us sometimes twelve hours 
of walking, trying to get up that mountain. And when you get up there, they they find the area you're supposed to go to, and and we be up there uh, for a few days before we move on. It was uh, it wasn't ground as much as taking mountains at that time. The, the the one that had the highest mountain had the best view of, of the, the other. And at night time, it was like the Fourth of July fireworks. You, you see the shooting, uh, especially the, the tracing bullets at night, and it looks like they're just crawling, as, as you know, uh, along, uh, climbing. But uh, we'd be up there, uh, three, four days, five days. Uh, Days didn't mean nothing. Uh, it didn't mean every day was the same, and we had had um, K rations we had up there, and uh, I didn't like the. Let's see, the, the one in the morning was uh, chopped ham and eggs. They uh, in a can like a tuna can, and. Uh, we used to put them in boiling water or something to get to heat them up. It's the only way you could eat them, really. And uh, there used to be uh, three, uh, we used to call them medicine cookies, uh, crackers, uh, this long, and dextro tablets. And there used to be an um, aluminum package of coffee and I used to uh, trade oh and there you'd be three cigarettes in a little little container and uh, in, in every box so the fellas that smoked I used to trade my cigarette I never smoked never did never will <laughs> and um, so I used to trade my cigarettes for their coffee, because the, the that would be the breakfast box. The luncheon box was always uh, a can of cheese, the same size as the, the uh, breakfast one, can of cheese, dextro tablets, or, uh, uh, three, three crackers, and uh, three cigarettes. Yeah. I think that was all that was in there. And the same thing at night time was, uh, it's supposed to be beef and the three crackers and bullion. Yeah, a bullion. I couldn't understand why they didn't give coffee, but they didn't. They gave us bullion. It used to be a bullion thing. So, but I always swap my that cigarettes off so, for something else, and everybody used to come around me. I I think I was the only one in the whole army that never smoked, <laughs> and, and uh, they always asked, swap this, or swap that, and, but. Uh, the the, chi the the beef can oh god some guys used to burn the whole thing it was so bad it was real bad in fact uh, I heard of course uh, I don't know how true the story was but that they used to, uh, it was Kellogg's on the box that we were getting and uh, I heard that some some guys would write to the a C CEO of the comp and threatened them with the, <laughs> their lives. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really bad. Uh, the only way you could eat it was almost burn it. Burn it. it used to take and cut the the box the, uh, that these things came in were all waxed because of the, uh, we used to say they were from World War One. 
that, but the box, so you used to cut the box in half and turn it and light it so that you could heat your coffee over. Uh, and uh, and, and it, it did the job as far, as far as the box goes. It, it did, uh, so we used to, but we used to burn the one that said dinner on it. Uh, the the meat, whatever it was that the meat that they put in there was horrible. It was real horrible. And uh, tell me though, Mr. Fleming, you're doing great, but um, those first few days in combat, you know, in the mountains around Naples, I mean. Were the did you guys engage with the Germans on the top of the mountains or was it no? It's mostly uh, motor fire and uh, artillery fire. We didn't engage them. No. So your first real heavy combat was Anzio then. Anzio. But before Anzio, do you remember the first time you came across German casualties? Uh, it was in Italy, uh, southern Italy. Uh, I, I really don't because there, there was a lot of casualties um, of civilians, and uh, we didn't pay you know any attention. I, I remember seeing um, German Germans had a lot of messengers that. Rode motorcycles, and I seen uh, seen one was on the side of the road, still sitting on a motorcycle that was on fire, and he was probably killed, uh, dead before the the motorcycle caught fire or whatever. But the, it was burning. We just walked by him. You know. After a while, it it got so that. Uh, is a, a almost common thing to see. Uh, on Anzio, they stopped the war for so, so many hours. There were so many dead bodies between Germans and the United States. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I was one of the ones they picked to go out and pick up the American dead. Uh, some of them were Rigor Mortis set in already on them. And we had a, a Jeep pulling a um, trailer behind it. And, and we used to put the bodies in the trailer. But, I mean, they were all stiff. You couldn't do anything. Uh, just put them in there on top of each other. But they did stop the war in Anzio for a while. While uh, both sides were out there picking up bodies. Uh, what was that like for you to, you know, to be in a position to be so close to, you know, American dead? Well, uh, after a while, uh, I don't know, it, it was it's, it was hard. I. I uh, you, you're ordered to do it, you know, and, and uh, you, you try to be gentle, really, but, uh, and, and you try not to look at them, really. You, you don't look at their face. But uh, there was about a half a dozen of us that the fellow driving the jeep, and then, then the rest of us picking up the bodies. There were so many bodies out there uh, on Anzio. I mean, did you guys actually have to go look for them, or had they... No, you, you, you could see them. We know the area they were in there. Uh, no, we didn't We didn't have to look very far. For but uh, we were out there for so many hours that... Uh, all that. Could you see the Germans also doing the same thing? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The same thing. That must have been something to be close to the enemy without you know worrying about being uh, killed. Yeah, uh, uh, that's true. Uh, uh, 
but I don't even know how they got together to uh, have the truce. That's what it was, the truce uh, for so many hours. And, uh, but uh, there was quite a few dead, though, out there. So, so if you could please go back and explain, uh, from Naples, how did you get to Anzio? What do you remember about the invasion of Anzio? Well, uh, we didn't know anything about Anzio, really. We were we were in a rest area, and uh, we were told uh, we we're going to make an what we used to call it end run, and and uh, we were going to make an end run, and we said we didn't know what to expect. Because we we got on a landing craft and it went it went out straight like out in the ocean, then it cut off, uh, to make sure that it was away from the land I guess. And and when we get close to Anzio, we got orders to everybody down you know down below the sides of the ship. Or the landing craft, and uh, then when we got near, they said uh, lock and load. You mean put putting the cartridges into the whatever weapon you're having, you have, and be ready. And when the when the front comes down, you, you get off fast because because uh, they want to pull the uh, landing craft out of the way for others to come in. So uh, w we did, uh, and we we might uh, we got to a certain uh, uh, trucks, uh, and we didn't think much of it because it was pretty calm then, and uh, riding in trucks, but uh, we only went a certain distance in the trucks and we're told to unload and from then on you're walking. So it had to be an area where the, the, there was no uh, artillery fire. And so we walked and we get, and they said, dig in. And so we dug, dug in and uh, we moved around. Uh, the, the the overpass. We 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 had to go there twice. Uh, it it was um, one track railroad from, that came down from Rome down to the toll of. of uh, of Italy. And it was built up. Uh, Anzio is just a flat land and a, a lot of water. Uh, but the railroad had to be built up because uh, their winter there was rain. And it used to get oh, a lot of rain we used to get. So we, we were soaking wet all the time. And, um, so, so they uh, they call it the overpass, and uh, in one area was an opening where you could drive through, and that's uh, that's uh, where uh, a lot of fighting went on 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 that area, and. Uh, we we used to dig in instead of digging down where you're going to hit water. We used to dig in the side of the overpass, and um, then uh, we just get shelled a lot there, and down <coughs> where we were stationed, down below. <coughs> was a tank. Well, the tank was low enough from the overpass that the Germans couldn't see it. But the, there was a tank there. 
But I, I know that the tankers got these, uh, it's a cardboard box about that long and about that way. It was, um, they had can, canned food and everything and they, they, they were really, had good good food. So I went down to, to them. They were about uh, oh, 30 yards from where we were. Uh, and uh, I, I went underneath the tank. They have a trap door on that tank. And I knocked on the door and I opened it. And I said, you got any canned stuff you're not using? And sure, he gave me cans of string beans and beets and different things like that. And I took them back to the fellas. Because we didn't get them, we got K rations. And, uh, but they gave us that. They didn't give us any meat or anything, but uh, they did give us. Uh, can, can you talk, uh, can you please talk about your experiences under artillery fire at Anzio? I mean, put me in your shoes. Oh, God. Artillery. They, when they start firing, we know they three or four shells they, at a time they would do. And then they stopped. Uh, there was one house in this whole area. It was about 50 yards back from where we were standing, maybe a little more. And uh, we had two fellows there. It was Rick, uh, Richard Fosco and Bor Borowitz. Borowitz just come back from the hospital after being wounded, and they were stationed there to, so that the Germans, if, uh, they used to try to have these uh, troops sneak out to the, there or something, you know. So, uh, and the rest of us were up at the, the crossover, and uh, the, we got uh, we got heavy shelling uh, during the night there, and um, he, uh, so the lieutenant Lieutenant Lafay he called our, our, the sergeant I had Sergeant Nienberg, uh and said he he wanted. He hasn't heard from the two fellows that were in the back. He said they, I don't want him, He wanted them checked out, and uh, so they asked for volunteers to go with Nyberg, and I went. So I went with him, and and one other fellow went, and and we went there, and we looked all around for him, and. Uh, Eddie Nienberger, he, he called us and he, he says, I found him. He says, let's go back. And, we, and of course, we stopped and looked at him and he said, where are they? And he says, they're both dead. And they were, they were both in a foxhole dug next to the building. And there wasn't a mark on them, but there was a shell hole I say about three feet from their their hole, and they died of con concussion. And, uh, and they were both holding hands together. Uh, Richard Fosco, oh, that brings back mem memories. And, uh, so we went back, and they reported them, anyways. And uh, the war went on, still went on. I mean, did you realize before that incident that not only could you get killed from the shrapnel, but the concussion could kill? Did you ever, did you think about that? Uh, I didn't think about it, no, because uh, 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 no, I never, I, I never thought about, although I got, uh, I, I myself got hurt by concussion. Uh, but it was in uh, 
in Germany where I got hurt. Uh, no, way after. Way after. Uh, but, uh, and boy, it, it, it is really something. Uh, but uh, Richard Fosco and Borowitz just got back from the hospital from being hit before. Well, while we're talking about those two men, can you share a little bit about what kind of men they were, your memories of them as people? Uh, I know more about uh, Fosco than I did uh, Borowitz because uh, uh, Fosco and I were uh, uh, paired together uh, at one time. You know, some, sometimes they switch around a different squad, depending on how many guys are left. And um, he's from, he was South, South Bend, Indiana, near near Notre Dame. And uh, he was the only boy in the family. Yeah, and uh, uh, farm, farm people. He was very, very religious. He was very religious. He he wouldn't look at a picture of a a, a woman that's half dressed or something. He would never look like that. Nothing like that. But he was it was really a, a very religious guy. Quiet, very quiet. He wasn't tall. But uh, he was a farmer, a farm boy. Uh, Richard F Borowitz, I didn't know too much about at all, uh, because I, I, I never, he wasn't in my the same squad or anything like. like I, but we we moved around as depending on how many guys were left. Uh, uh, how old would you say uh, Borowitz was when he was killed? I say around the same age as I was, was twenty one. Actually, I <laughs> that was a big joke too. I was in Italy and I was reading the newspaper. And usually, the papers are old when I start. And I was reading them. And some it was somebody else's paper, and uh, I just happened to look at the date. <laughs> <laughs> I says, uh, Eddie Nyberg was with me. Uh, I says, Eddie, I says, I had a birthday three weeks ago. <laughs> I I forgot I turned 21 three weeks before, until I read the paper. That <laughs> I turned 21. Yeah. That's really something. Uh, I never, never thought of a birthday. I, I didn't even the the date. Uh, well, yeah. you're, you're doing amazing. Um, I mean, could, could you talk about uh, my understanding of Anzio is that you guys were in the flat area. Yeah. The Germans were up in the Albin Hills. Yeah. And so because they have the high ground, you guys had to stay dug in for about four months. Oh, yeah. I mean, talk to me about, um, I mean, do you remember going on any patrols? Or, I mean, what were what were the engagements you remember happening while uh, you were at Anzio? To you personally. Uh, uh, I remember uh, we were at, um, they, they kept swapping us around different, there was a, what we used to call the pines. Uh, it was a group of pine trees. The only thing, uh, in it, and it used to be, they uh, used to figure it like a rest area. And uh, we moved into the pine trees one, uh, one time. It's the only time it ever did. And we dug, and every time when you make a move, you dig a foxhole. So we had dug a foxhole, and uh, Sergeant Nineberg, he he's come up. He says, "Okay, we're moving." <laughs> of 
course, everybody looked at him. I said, Are you joking? We just started, we just dug these holes. And then he said, uh, he says, we're moving down to the beach. We looked at him. We looked down to the beach. He says, yeah. He says, intelligence got word that the Germans are going to try to put some people ashore from submarines on the beach down here. So, so I, I, uh, so we packed up. We down at the beach and there's the sand dunes, you know, like it's the any beach. And we set up our machine guns. Three, we had three machine guns along there. And, uh, we didn't even d dig in to be truthful about it, but uh, and we had to watch the water to see if anyone's coming ashore. All night long, uh, you know, different ones were on duty, and uh, that re that reminds me of the story of Italy. But uh, you know, I go back there. No, tell me. Uh, well, in Italy, it was, it was similar. We were in. It was a cold, cold rain, and we were in a. Um, uh, where they have grape, grape, well, they have these little, um, like dugouts or something, and they have these wine case casts in them. And, uh, but it, it was dry in there except for the floor. There, there was like a space like this in the floor in the middle, and it was filled with water you know, that seeped in there, I suppose. But on the a, on a, um, sides were these uh, kegs that they had wine in. And then, of course, the fellas took the kegs out and put their blankets up on, a, on the shelf and were sleeping in there. But yeah, we, we still had machine guns out there that we had manned at night and uh, we <laughs> we would be on for one to two hours sh shifts you know so, and so if, if we were on two hours that meant uh, you know somebody else be on two hours so and the daylight would be but it was still a freeze a, a, a real cold rain and nobody wanted to be out, but we went out. So I, they'd come down in the hall and wake you up. You get up and they'd take your place, <laughs> and you go. Out. So, so this night, oh God, they, I got woke up three times. <laughs> I said, "What are you talking about? I just come out. Uh, just come back in." I said, that's your turn. <laughs> I said, so it ended up nobody was on guard duty. <laughs> Everybody was so cold out there. We didn't have any winter clothes or, or even raincoats or anything. And uh, so nobody stayed on duty. Either. But I was woke up three times to go out and stand on it. Yeah, I will, and I go back to sleep. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, uh, that was a, a lot of funny things there. Yeah, like in the uh, Benefro Mountains, we had this Italian fella join join our outfit, and and his his is a story. He he, he lived. In Alsace Lorraine, uh, his mother was French. His father, no, his mother was, I, I don't know which one, either French and the father was Italian. Yeah, it, it had to be, he had an Italian name. And 
he was, uh, well, he was in France with, living with the mother on a farm. The French wanted to draft him for a service. So his mother took him to Italy, to Rolofs's in Italy. And while he was in Italy, Mussolini wanted to draft him. So some way or another, they got him to the United States. And he was drafted in the United States Army. Scalabrino was his name. Yeah, Scalabrino. <laughs> and we used to kid him about that. Uh, he ended up in the, in the United States Army after Germany wanted him and France wanted him. Uh, what happened to him? I really don't know. I don't know, really. I, uh, just uh, on a side note, I, 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 I know who you're talking about because I looked up a, a photograph of you on the internet and he's in a photograph with you and two other men. Uh, and in the caption, it says that he was he died during the war. Oh, So I never know. Uh, I'll show you that photo later. But oh, yeah, that would be good. Going back, though, uh, you're doing great, but going back to Anzio, did you guys have any opportunities to use the anti-tank gun? No, no. So were you just being used as riflemen? Uh, it, riflemen. We didn't use the anti-tank gun there because we'd be up on the, the Germans could see us very easily. And, and uh, What about patrols? Did you guys have to go on? Oh, we went on patrols. Uh, not too much. Uh, uh, there was a, a, a cemetery there. That's where all the, actually, uh, the ground fighting took place was in the cemetery. The Germans would have patrols in the cemetery, and we'd have patrols in the cemetery. And they used to fight each other every every night. It was mostly nighttime because uh, I answered like, answer like this floor here. It's, it, 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 there was nothing to hide behind. And especially with them up in the mountains and they had these uh, glasses that they, they could pick out an ant, I think, because uh, anything that moved down there was was shelled. Uh, every, everything was shelled down there. It's uh, we, we, Nobody could move during the daytime down there. We used to, as soon as it got dark, we'd get out of our holes and we'd sit out inside the banks or something like that. And nobody moved that night because uh, uh, the Germans would send, send patrols and we would send patrols. Uh, and uh, it was very static. Yeah, and uh, what would you do all day though if you couldn't move in the day? Uh, no, we just stay, stayed in our holes during the day, sleep, because we'd be awake all night long. Because that's when, the, if there was any fighting, it was going to be at night. And uh, can, can you tell me, sir, do you remember any specific incidences where you saw the enemy infantry at Anzio approaching your position? Uh, not, appro not approach. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Not in Italy, that's for sure. Um, Oh, oh uh, it was in France, Reaperswiler, yeah, Reaperswiler. Reaperswiler, we seen, uh, we were, we were up in um, on a, a wooded area and we heard a noise behind us actually. And it was a German, uh, outfit that was that's raiding our lines. Yeah, a German outfit. And we had a machine gun on them. Uh, but as soon as we opened fire, they disappeared. It never knew what happened to, to them. And uh, we got a call on the radio from the outfit that was next to us. And uh, it was a lieutenant, and he, he was mad. He says, 
uh, what are you doing over there? You're forcing the Germans to come over in our position. <laughs> so, so he didn't know who he was talking to anyways. And uh, the fellow that was on the phone, he says to him, so what? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, they they were behind us, a, a, a German scouting outfit, and uh, and they took off as soon as we opened fire on them with a machine gun. But we knew we, we knew that we didn't hit them. But uh, but they took off as long as they took off. We we didn't care as long as they kept away from us. <laughs> But uh, believe me, I, I have a lot. Of, I have a lot of questions about uh, Reapersweiler. Uh, I've done quite a bit of research about your role, your platoon there. So I want to save that though for later. Going back to Anzio, the Germans made a huge counterattack where they almost drove you guys back to the sea. Yeah, we were. Uh, what, yeah. Was, what was your personal experience during that? Well. Um... Our, our personal, our, our command uh, was, oh, no, he was a battalion commander, General uh, 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 Sparks. Uh, I think he was lieutenant colonel then. Mm -hmm. and, and he, he, I know he told Lieutenant Lafay that hold your positions, we're staying. And, and we were the the last one, you know, in the in the line. We were on the left hand flank. We were the last of the flank. It, and, um, the ocean was out, the sand dunes and everything. Like that. And uh, he, so he told the we were standing there. So he, he so the fate, Whatever machine guns we had and everything, we put up and waited. And fortunately, uh, it it didn't didn't happen on our end. I don't know if it happened. Uh, I can't remember if it happened inland more. But they they didn't attack down where we were. But uh, we used to. Get shelled. There was a that factory I was telling you about. We used to get shelled from that factory, and uh, but it's all open ground between the factory and where we were. Uh, at least uh, uh, I would say three hundred, three hundred yards or something. I don't know what, even what that factory was for there, uh, because it was the only building around that whole area, and. Uh, I, I didn't realize how poor these people were in, in, in southern France, uh, southern Italy. They were, they were really poor. Uh, uh, they had no, no running water in their houses, and no no uh, bathrooms in their houses. Uh, they used the barns that. Let me see. We used to <laughs> George Welgus. He was he was a he was a, scr he was a scrounger. He found out they they had one in this one village we were in. They had a like a horse trough uh, uh, drinking, and they had a. a Oh, I don't. Th I think a half-inch pipe coming out of the ground, running water constantly into the trough, going out the other end. But in in the thing, being farmers, they had a lot of chickens. They had eggs down in there because they, they keep them fresh from turning back. And uh, George found out that they had the eggs in the and he he used to get his helmet loaded with him and take him and boil him hard boil him so he could carry him <laughs> the eggs uh, yeah George was always scrounging food and then he found out that 
they hung food up in the chimney to smoke it. And uh, used to find hams or something up there if he was lucky. And uh, he, he, he's, he had distributed amongst the guys, but uh, uh, he, was, he was good. George, he was, he was always scrounging from, uh, actually I made him a sergeant. George. What a, you know, you mentioned Felix Sparks. Yeah. He was an original of the outfit. Yeah. What did you think of him uh, just as a leader in general? Uh, it was very, very good because he led. He didn't stand back. And uh, the first time I met him, uh, he was a captain. And uh, at the end of the war, he would become a colonel. But he was, uh, actually he became a major ahead of our battalion. Uh, yeah. And um, he, he was an officer that led, not order and stay back and let somebody else. He, he do it. Actually in um, France, when we were trapped, he hopped on a, a scout car. This was a, a, like a, a, a scout car that had, a, it's a two-man car, uh, like, like a small tank uh, with a 37 million, millimeter uh, cannon on it. But the cannon had to shoot straight. It didn't shoot. It, uh, go side to side and um, we were trapped in uh, this is in front I'm jumping around now that's fine uh, he, this was in France uh, and uh, we were trapped up at uh, oh we, we lost a battalion up in uh, the woods in France, uh, and we, we uh, at that time we were in reserve our our company, and when the other company uh, uh, there was three companies that were trapped up up, up on this mountain, of uh, uh, from the third battalion, and. Um, we were we were ordered to see if we could break through, and we went up. And in fact, we lost half the bullet. Our that, the guys that went uh, with us uh, up there were killed, um, and the the fellows that were with me, we were trapped up there. Uh, we couldn't. Move. Uh, there was a machine gun, a pistol. Uh, it was a machine gun pistol. A German had us uh, down in a um, gully, like uh, where a big tree uprooted out of the ground, and so there was a little hole there that we were in, and um, it was my squad and a couple of other fellows from other squads. Uh, this fellow named Neff, uh, both his legs were, sh uh, feet were shot. This, uh, and uh, I went out and brought him back to the hall. And we, uh, this machine gun uh, pistol, the, the guy had, had us pinned down in there. Uh, I think there ended up four of us in that oh, plus the, the one that got and oh Mach Machias he was in another uh, group and his wife just had a baby girl and he was I seen him out there and it, it looked like he was sitting up he was sitting up 
so, so I knew he was hit, so I went out after him, and he was dead there. He just died sitting up, and uh, yeah, Machias. And uh, uh, so I got back to the hole, and I sent one guy, went out, and ran for help and down, uh, down a path behind us. Where, and we just gave him covering fire. And Sparks came up on the back of a scout car. It had, it had a 50, 57 millimeter uh, uh, machine gun on it. And he was firing at it. He came up and they loaded the wound of the guy on the back of it, and the other fellows got behind it, and they walked back down the mountain. Uh, well, it was, it was the mountain, but they went back down to the bottom where uh, Lieutenant Lafay was, and it, that set it up, uh, set, set up a uh, firing line. And Wilgus was in that fire on that. And so uh, he got, uh, so everybody got out of there except uh, Larry Matthias. Larry. And I just thought of his name. Um, I, I appreciate you sharing the story. I'm definitely going to want to cover that whole thing in more detail uh, when we get to that part. But we're, we're going to take a break. But I, I have one question before we take a break, okay? Yeah. Back at Italy, do you remember any experiences you had against the German Luftwaffe? Were you ever strafed by the Germans? Oh, uh, we were only strafed once, but uh, we were bombed by them. Uh, but uh, fortunately, the bombing was uh, a little ways away from us. The, the, well, <laughs> the, the, uh, the funny part of one of them, the bombing, was from our own plane. They, they, you know, they, they, they always, we always had uh, fighter planes protecting us overhead, and I guess in between there. Uh, and they carried a, a spare tank uh, so they could stay up longer, and and they were. This one plane was flying over us. Uh, we knew it was ours, and we were all sitting there uh, on the ground looking up at it. And he released his uh, spare tank. Well, he we was so high up, we didn't know what it was. <laughs> And we everybody dived for. <laughs> we thought it was a bomb coming down, but as it came down, you, you could see how it was floating around, uh, and uh, it it was a spare tank he let loose. Uh, once the tank got empty, they they loosened them up. Uh, and, uh, but you, you mentioned there was one time that you were strafed. What happened there? Strafed. Uh, Oh, oh, uh, we got straight. We were in a, not a convoy, just moving our anti tank guns. And uh, uh, we didn't see this plane because it came from behind us until it was almost uh, started shooting. And when he's shooting, even the driver of the truck pulling pull the anti tank on, he dived out. Everybody dives out and headed for the ditches and things. But, uh, but uh, luckily, the, the pilot himself, uh, the, the Germany was losing their air force at the time, I think, because uh, he was by himself. And, uh, we had our other planes always flew over our area constantly, our fighter planes. And uh, so he'd make that one pass at us and then 
just took off towards Germany. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we all dived into ditches and whatever we could. They, they left the trucks and everything out. <laughs> Save yourself. <laughs> uh. So tell me, sir, after Anzio, tell me about the invasion of southern France. What happened? Um, your memories of it. Well, the invasion of southern France was, uh, in my opinion, very uh, easy. Um, we weren't shelled only uh, now and then. Uh, it, one shell would go out. Uh, we hit the beat. Uh, the hardest part was jumping off the water and, and waving in it uh, because of the, the, uh, the, the landing craft that I was on stopped the way out further than it should have. And uh, when we jumped in, the water was up almost up to my neck. I was ready to throw everything off. And, um, we hit the shoreline and then we went straight up this hill that was in front of us. In the house, there was a house on top of the hill, which uh, fortunately was vacant. It was, it was a beautiful home, if I remember. Uh, I, I was only in, uh, you might say, uh, the main room when uh, somebody opened a drawer in the uh, Fireworks started and everybody dived out windows and doors and got out of the house and never went back to the house. And we continued up the hill for, I don't know how far, maybe a couple of more miles where we were halted while everybody got organized. And um, then we started inland. And I think, I, I don't know exactly when this happened, but they, they started a, a Butler's task force. It was a task, the Butler was a brig, brigadier general. It was a task force made up of um, tanks, scout cars, and, and, and the infantry. And um, what it was that uh, we weren't hitting, say, a line of Germans or anything. It was just a scattered group that you had come across. And um, so Butler's task force was to go, go as far as they could to see if they hit a main line. And... Uh, we, we would get uh, like sniper fire at us, but we would continue on uh, going straight through. And some fellows um, rode on top of the tanks and uh, others followed behind in the two and a half ton trucks. And if any firing happened, they would, of course, hop out and disperse. And um, there was groups of Germans that uh, we fired upon, but our tanks would fire their cannons and uh, uh, the machine guns at, at its groups. And of course, they were dispersed. And uh, they were just small groups. And we we went on qu quite a ways into uh, so we got the I think Re Reapers Weiler, uh, and uh, the, we had a fight uh, fighting in there. That's when uh, I think Butler, uh, Butler's task force did, then everybody went back to their normal outfits and. Uh, from then on, we, we were hitting, but uh, so Southern Germany, where we were, uh, 
We were good except for Reaper's Weiler. And uh, the mountains up in it, it, it was the, the Alps, we were near the Alps. And uh, fighting there, uh, I'm, I'm just picturing a, uh, 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 we, we were being shelled from a certain area. I, I, I don't remember the area, but uh, we, we fought our way and uh, we, uh, we got to Epinal, Epinal, France. It's the last big city before we hit the German border. The German border was just beyond that. And uh, in, in Epinal, the people re rebelled against the ones that uh, were uh, friendly with the Germans. Uh, the, the people were, and um, they. Uh, we were in Epinal maybe a, a day and a half, and all of a sudden a big crowd got out in this area in the middle of this t t Epinal. And they had a chair there. And well, of course, we were curious to know what's going on because the whole area was coming around there. And what it was, they had these women that uh, fraternized with the Germans. And they shaved their heads bald and ran them out of the out of the town, around, yeah, they ran them out of the town. There was a movie once I thought I'd seen where they showed these bald-headed women that formed a group, but uh, the, uh, that happened at Ep Epinal, they did. And Epinal was very close to the German border. And um, we, uh, we were going to attack across the German border, and the border had these, um, they, we, we call them alligator tooth, but they're concrete blocks that were all along the border. Now, I don't know if the, it was the French or the Germans that had them. German. <laughs> so they called it the Siegfried line, dragon teeth. Yeah, gray dragon, and uh, we got through them, and they're, they're, of course, they had a underground uh, block houses, and there, there was a block house there, but it was empty when we went through it, and, but uh, I think, uh, I. Th didn't France have a black house uh, 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 like a railroad underneath along the border? Either Germans or uh, French had it all along the border, uh, uh, under uh, underground. But I I, uh, I never was in it. Uh, but we went by it these black houses, there was, there was nobody there when we went by. And we were headed for Aschassenburg. And Aschassenburg was uh, uh, controlled by a German major that uh, he, he had several, I guess his officers shot that wanted to surrender or something like that. or or withdraw, and he hung people out on the street there. And uh, I, I don't know which officer in the United States Army or anything made him get and cut the, these people. He, he hung some of these people on lampposts in the, in the city. And uh, 
we we didn't stay t too long in Schaffenberg. Uh, now, uh, Schaffenberg, Nuremberg was a, I believe, was a German, um, like West Point. That's where I got all the flags and stuff. Nuremberg, and where, where Hitler used to give talks. Up, uh, up on a stand, it's big, big, wide open parade grounds. I, I'd call it parade grounds, but I don't know what a plaza is. Or but it was a huge place. And um, that's, uh, I, I went into uh, my, my platoon. We went into one building on, in this complex, is where I, got all these German flags and daggers and helmets and stuff, and I shipped them to my mother, who gave them away. <laughs> she gave every one of them away. Can you tell me about the resistance that you faced in Nuremberg? Uh, in, in Nuremberg, uh, it was house to house. Uh, actually, now I'm trying to think. I think in Nuremberg is where we relieved the 26th Division, the Yankee Division, because um, there was a major in charge uh, 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 of that um, uh, Yankee Division from Massachusetts, and uh, uh, and he, this major was a neighbor. Of, uh, ours back in Springfield. It was our neighbor. I used to, uh, he was older than I was, a, a, a lot older. And um, so I went looking for him. <laughs> and he, he was at a meeting with Colonel Sparks and, and others because we were relieving the 26th Division there. And <laughs> I seen him and I call him. I call him uh, Georgie. <laughs> George, uh, his name was George Georgie Amarato, an Italian. <laughs> and he come over and he give me a hug and uh, he says, "I'm glad to see you," but he says, "I can't talk to you." He says, "I'm going over the plans with your your commanding officer." <laughs> so, anyways, uh, I I, I say. The only one I met in two years overseas that I knew, actually you knew, Georgie Amarato. And uh, he was a major. And uh, so, uh, but uh, you were talking, we, we didn't. You were uh, talking about some of the engagements that you got into in Nuremberg. In, in Nuremberg. Uh, we had house to house fighting. Fortunately for me, I, we we didn't have to do the house to house fighting. We set up machine guns, or, you know, in different uh, crossroads and things like that. And um, uh, it, it wasn't bad. The people, in, in a sense, were happy to see us because this major. The German major that run the place was having people killed that wanted to surrender or or, or, or withdraw, especially the soldiers. The, the, he wanted to he, he, he'd have them killed, uh, and and then he was hanging the people that scare uh, scare the people, and especially the men. They were there were more men hung than any of them, and. Uh, but uh, we we move we kept moving out of there. We didn't stay in Nuremberg too long, because the the place uh, or um, uh, brick brick homes, beautiful brick uh, apartments uh, apartments, and and we were we were uh, our platoon was we set up in one apartment. 
And I was up on the second floor check, checking out the rooms and with, with the other fellas. And all of a sudden, oh, crash, an artillery shell went right through, right through. I, I bet it wasn't 20 yards in front of us, right through the building. Smashed, smashed the building. Uh, it was a German artillery shell. It wasn't uh, ours, and uh, so we we got out of there fast, and we moved out of Nuremberg on our way to to um, uh, Munich. We were headed headed towards Munich from Nuremberg, and on our way, Colonel Sparks got orders to swing to the right. To, there was a concentration camp there, and uh, so we did, and, and we went through a, a, a village of Dachau. There was a village of Dachau besides Dachau itself, and and um, so we went through. Uh, actually, our platoon stopped in the village of Dachau, which was all right with me, and then. Um, I had a, a new. I had four different lieutenants during the war, platoon leaders. Um, they uh, this one was. Uh, oh, what was this? Now I forget his name. Daily, daily, and and uh, he says, "Come on, let's go to the." Uh, camp, the, the Dachau prison camp. So we started up the railroad, there was a railroad tracks that went through the town and in, into the camp, you know, because they were bringing the, uh, they weren't, well, they were prisoners, but the bringing the people in from different parts of, uh, of Germany that, uh, to the concentration camps. And we went up and we come across two boxcars. The doors were open and all you could see was bodies in both boxcars. I had pictures of them. I had, I had a stack of them and uh, my wife, Dorothy, she's seen one picture. She says, I want them out of the house. And I says, okay, I'll, I'll find a place to give them. So Morris Cantor was a friend of mine at the American Legion. And I went to Morris and I said, Morris, I have pictures of Dachau. I says I like to give them to a Jewish uh, museum or something. I says, could you handle that? And he says, sure. I said, okay. I said, when I see you tomorrow, oh, when I see you tomorrow, I'll give you the pictures. I says, he says, okay, I appreciate it. So I gave them to him, and he gave them to a Jewish rabbi. I don't know what happened to him or anything like that, but. Uh, Were they pictures that you had taken yourself? No, I didn't take them. No, there was, uh, one of the fellows in the outfit took them, and he, he gave, I don't know how come he ended up giving me, a, a, he gave me a stack of them, of the boxcars and the, ovens and everything that went with the scamp and uh, uh, so he he gave me a so I gave him to Morris and Morris appreciate receiving him but didn't uh, you know like him of course and uh, when uh, what, what else happened when you walked into that camp? 
I, I didn't get into the camp. I got into as far as the gate. They um, the um, the rear. I don't know who it would be. Uh, notified Sparks allowed no one into the camp because they don't know about the diseases uh, and um, the people were they were starved really starved and uh, but the, the government our government had had set up a special unit to go into this these camps the doctors nurses and uh, I suppose cooks or whatever, but uh, medical people. And uh, but uh, a platoon of ours out of the third th th um, uh, battalion went into the camp, and with them was a um, a chaplain. Uh, 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 there's a, there was a picture of marching out with the, uh, they they captured quite a few of the guards. Some of the guards escaped out the back of the camp be, before we got there. They knew that it's going to happen, and um, then there were some of them were killed by one of our machine gunners. Uh, he was, they, they lined some uh, of the German prisoners up against the wall to hold them. And they had this uh, machine gunner watch them with the machine guns, uh, you know, not to kill them, to watch them. But as soon as everyone cleared away, he opened fire and he killed them all. Uh, and uh, they were going to court martial him, but Sparks had him transferred out of the outfit before they. So they dropped it. Did, but he he was really upset about them. Were Were you in the camp at that time, or you heard about this happening? Oh, I was outside the camp. They wouldn't let anyone in the camp except for the uh, the platoon that went in to look for the. The German uh, guards that were there, most of them, were going out the back, uh, escaping. I see. So yeah. It was only a platoon from headquarters that actually went in. Uh, yeah. Did uh, did you, after that, I mean, did you hear the machine gun fire? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, you could hear that. Yeah. After that, machine gun fire erupted. What did you and the other guys think had happened? Well, uh, we we thought somebody went crazy. That the you know uh, uh, when they seen they seen the prisoners the way they were uh, there, and uh, it's uh, there was a, a a little story on the side. I I and I I know it's the story is true. Um, this major general, I th I forget what other division. It wasn't from the forty fifth. It was another division, the forty second. He he came up to the gate. Well, Sparks' orders were no one is to go in there, no matter what rank they had. So he wouldn't let a. a this major general showed up at the gate. And he had a, a a woman's news reporter with him, and he was giving her and gonna give her an exclusive to the prison camp, and Sparks wouldn't let him in. And uh, he had he was one of these guys that had a writing tr stick or whatever you call him, and. Uh, he had it, and he, uh, the the sergeant. Oh God, I forgot his name now. I I know him so well, but I forgot his name. That, that was aide to uh, Colonel Colonel Sparks. This general put this dryness stick on his shoulder, oh, because 
they, he, he was there and telling them, and Spark was telling him, you're not going in. And so he put this writing, uh, writing stick on his shoulder and um, he, the sergeant said to the general, he said, you either take that off or he says, I'm gonna blow it off. <laughs> and so I'm gonna have, he says, I'm gonna have you court martial for this. So it was, uh, after the, uh, I think it was the same day, but late in the day that we got, we got orders to go on to Munich. It, it was Spark. And we went out to Munich, and we didn't see any fighting going into Munich. And um, while in Munich, this general brought charges up against Sparks and the sergeant. And at that time, Patton was named commissioner, like or something, of Munich area. And he ordered, they ordered Sparks to report to his office, Patton's office at a certain, certain time. So they did, they walked in and uh, Patton heard the st story of Sparks. And so he says to Sparks, he says, you and the sergeant Pack your things and get on the next boat for the States. <laughs> Just, that's all. That was all it was said the Patton said to him. And uh, so nothing happened there and that uh, uh, he didn't think much of, of the general, you know, the other the general that brought the and and uh, so they they went to and and then we were we were, I was happy where, where we were camped because the war was over. And I, oh, and, and that was it. They, uh, it call, they called me into the battalion CP and it said, we want you platoon to op, uh, occupy two, uh, they have these, uh, jails th throughout the city, you know, like s s satellite jails or something, I don't know what you call them. But uh, they were small places uh, in different areas. And so I had to put guys in, in each jail house. And um, I don't know why, uh, really, because we didn't have any prisoners. And, um, uh, they they would be at nighttime be s snipers shooting into the jailhouses. <coughs> in the in, in, in the uh, uh, they weren't soldiers; they were just civilians shooting. And, and, <coughs> and so, in uh, my job, I, I check them. Uh, I had to bring them, I, I, I had a Jeep, of course, I had a Jeep all the way after I made platoon sergeant. Uh, I had to go from each jail and bring them like breakfast, lunch, and dinner different times during the day. And uh, that, that worked out uh, all right because I got to see part of Munich. And, uh, and it, 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 Munich was altogether different than all the others. It, it was another different country, really. <coughs> Why don't you get some water, sir? Yeah, I got some. I'm, I'm, we're having to take a break for one sec. I, I was wounded two times. And, and take take me through. You know, what was the first time? Where was it? What happened? Oh uh, God! Oh, I gotta think. Um. The first time, it, it was in, in Italy. 
it, it, it was from a, an artillery show. Uh, it wasn't a piece of metal, it was a piece of rock that went in right across my uh, my wrists here. And my wrists, uh, I, didn't, I didn't do anything about it because I thought it was just the same. And uh, two days later, my wrist was up like a balloon. And uh, I went to the medics and uh, they had me, <laughs> I'll never forget, take my helmet off. They poured water in it and they heated it up on a Coleman stove and had me soak it in. And I, I had to do that for three, three days, be, then went back. And um, the doctor lands it and all this pus and stuff come out and bandage it up. I had to have it in the sling like this. And it, that was before we went to, just before we were going to, um, uh, Anzio, yeah. It had to be Anzio. And, I mean, do you remember what you were doing when that shell landed? <sighs> Ducking. <laughs> I, I really don't. I, I don't remember that. No. That's okay. Uh, oh. So wh why don't you tell me now about the second time? How were you wounded the second time? Uh, the, the second time, it was in uh, the Black Force in Germany. I was the platoon sergeant, tech sergeant, and um, we we were I I forget where we were going, but it was in the Black Forest, and Colonel Spark said he want uh, there was hardly any fighting there. And, and we were going to event, this was like in the evening. Uh, Colonel Sparks sent for me and he, and he said, send the patrol out because we're in the Black Forest. He says, and see how far they go before they make contact. He says, just let him make contact and then come back. So I sent uh, a six-man patrol out because of the, uh, the force, and one of them separated a little bit because if the Germans are dug in, they would get them all at once or, or, or watch. So send the patrol out. And then they come back, and I was. Uh, oh, they reported the sparks. That's what they did. And this one fella, I think his name was Mansfield. I, I'm not sure of him because uh, he was very new to the outfit. He just arrived from the States maybe two or three weeks before. And they were talking to Sparks. I wasn't there when they were talking to him. And um, they, they said they did, uh, the, the buck sergeant that led the group um, reported that he didn't come across anyone, you know, and how far they went. And this Mansfield opened up his mouth. I, I, always, I always remember because I told him I'd shut it up for him if he ever opened it up again. <laughs> and, uh, because he says, I seen a, a German machine gun in a hole. But he says, there's nobody around. And he said that to Sparks. And Sparks hit the roof. And he sent for me. 
and he told me what the report was. He says, you take a, 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 and go out and take a squad out and see what you can find. So I, I said to him, I'm pretty sure his name was Mansfield. I said, you're coming with us and show us where you've seen that machine gun. So we went out and, and we got in the woods so far distance and I said, all right, we're gonna separate a little, but we're going to uh, keep in contact, eye contact with each other. Don't, don't lose each other. So we, we did. And I and I kept Mansfield. I said it was close to me. And I said, "Where did you see that?" He said, "Up a little further. Up a little." I kept saying, it, "Up a little further." And uh, all of us sudden, the machine gun opened fire, and uh, and so I I I hit the ground naturally, and and so and two of the other fellows were hit. Mansfield wasn't hit though. And um, the next thing I knew, I heard a thud and then a, an explosion. I thought my left shoulder was gone. I really did. And I put my hand inside my blouse and came out all blood. And Mansfield was all right there. I said, okay, we made contact. Let's go back. We lost three guys were, were killed there. And uh, all because he didn't know enough when he seen the machine gun in the beginning to tell the sergeant that he was with, there's a machine gun here. And what it was, the Germans were probably taking a break somewhere and away from it, and they couldn't get back to that machine gun. And so, uh, anyways, I, I went back and I says, we, we made contact. He says, uh, the Sparks, he says, I heard it, I heard it. We'll take care of them in the morning. And of course, in the morning, they were gone. The Germans were gone. And I ended up going to the hospital to have x-ray taken because the blood was coming out through my pores. It didn't break the skin. Just the concussion forced the blood through my pores. And I, I spent two days in the hospital and I, I went up to the nurse and said, I'm going back to my outfit. She says, you'll go back when the doctor tells you to. And so that night I went back <laughs> to the outfit. But uh, that was the story there. That's how I got it. Uh, uh, that incident, that explosion, I mean, you think that was a shell that just... It was a concussion grenade. It was a grenade, concussion. Okay. And, and you mentioned some of the American, three of them were killed. Yeah. I mean, how did you know they had been killed and not just wounded? Well, uh, because uh, when it got daylight, this was a, this what happened at uh, early in the night, and uh, uh, so in the morning we went. We were, you know, scouting a party out. We were advancing then at that spot because that's where the machine gun was. And um, I wasn't with him because I had to go have my shoulder examined. And um, they come across them, the bodies. I just have some general questions about your time uh, after the invasion of France all the way to 
the end of the war. Yeah. I'll ask you these general questions and whatever specific stories you can come up with. Um, sir, can you please tell me about some of the times you remember using the anti-tank gun? The anti-tank, uh, the 57? Sure. That's the anti-tank gun. Uh, uh, I, I use it Actually, we used it once after that. We didn't see any German tanks. Uh, it, it was at a house. Um, there, uh, there was, uh, we got some, uh, just rifle fire from this house. And, and so we uh, had one, one, we had three of those uh, 57s in the platoon. Uh, I had uh, one of them uh, aim, uh, aim for the house. I says, put a shot through a window somewhere, anywhere, because you get one shot through, who's ever in there is going to leave. And they did. And uh, there was some, I think it was about four or five Germans in it. And they went out the back door down into a woods that was behind the, the house. And uh, that's all we wanted. Uh, but, but I mean, tell me more about that. I mean, where was that? The, uh, uh, the, exactly where? I don't know. Uh, I couldn't couldn't remember where. It was in Germany, though. Okay. It was in Germany, out in the out in the country. It wasn't it wasn't in a, a city or anything like that. It was a, a farmhouse. And then I mean, tell me. I mean, what were the what kind of damage was that German rifle fire doing? Were they pinning anyone down, or? Oh no, they were firing at us. We were we were moving forward, uh, and we stopped at a uh, I don't know what it was, a, a, just in the field, I guess, to, uh, because uh, we weren't uh, receiving any fire from anywhere around that area, and then this. Uh, rifle fire started, and so we opened fire on them with with one one shot. That's all, we, and uh, they moved out of there. And uh, we weren't out to kill anyone. Then. I mean, if it, they get killed, they got killed. But we weren't looking for because it's, the war was ending, and. Uh, we of course we didn't want any of our fellows hurt either. Did you guys fire at the Germans as they left the house? No, we didn't see them leave the house because they were out, went out the back way, we, ops, well opposite way that we were. And uh, so, what makes you think they left the house and they weren't wounded in the house? Because we didn't get any fire after that at all, and uh, we tried to stay away from houses. Uh, because uh, a lot of people still, you know, stayed in the house, and there were children and uh, you know, women and so forth. What? Uh, so was that the only time you guys used the fifty-seven while you were in the platoon? Oh no, we had uh, a sixty millimeter machine guns. We had the machine guns. Uh, we had three of them, well, three, four, four, uh, four. Can you tell me about uh, some of the times you remember using the machine guns? Uh, uh, yeah, it was, uh, uh, we were uh, advancing in Germany. It was similar to that, what I just said to you. Uh, there was a, a American squad on the first floor of this house that was tra trapped because on the second floor was Germans. And uh, if uh, the American force couldn't go up the stairs because the Germans had it covered, and they couldn't go out because they'd, they'd be shot through the, from the windows above. And uh, I forget now who, t who told, told me that. So what I did, I set a machine gun, a 60 caliber machine gun, up 
at 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 the end of, uh, of a building that was away from there, like a um, storage building, uh, and um, I put it at the corner, and 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 I had the other fellows watching the windows in case the Germans seen me putting the machine gun out there. Uh, and uh, fire at them to keep up, to keep them down, and they did. And uh, they they didn't fire at us. The, the, the Germans did. And I got the machine gun, fifty caliber machine gun. I I, I really like enjoying uh, shooting the fifty caliber. And I opened fire at one end of the building, on the second floor. They were on the second floor, uh, on the second floor, and I ran the, the whole building down and back. And the fellows on the first floor, which was ours, they they come running out up to where we were. And uh, I don't know if the Germans got out the back way or not, because we never, uh, it was coming near the end of the war, and uh, we we weren't gonna look for trouble, <laughs> it, it, you know. Didn't want any more of our guys shot and killed, and uh, they uh, they got out, the German group got out the back. But uh, what makes you think they got out the back? Well, there's nobody left up in the in the house after as uh, after these fellows got out. They they were stationed around there. We were going by there. And, and when we stopped to help them. And uh, so we continued on our way, and they, they stayed up around that barn. And uh, it, it, uh, and uh, so I, I never met any of them, only there for a brief minute, you know, so because we had to keep moving. And um, I was at a convention in Colorado and I was sitting with a group of fellows that were with me in in the service, and uh, this fellow come over. He says he says to, uh, he says you don't know, know me or you don't remember me, but he says I was one of the fellows that was trapped in that house. That day. I said oh I said oh, I'm I'm glad you got home home all right. And he says, yeah, he says, Every, everything was good after that. So that's just... That must have made you feel good. Oh, yeah, it did. I have somebody remember. Uh, he recognized me, but I didn't recognize him. But uh, Do you remember yeah. seeing the Germans in the windows when you fired the machine gun? Or? No, I don't. No, I, I didn't see any of them. I just opened fire on the windows up there and... And uh, I, I had an idea that if, if, if I fired up in the windows, you know, from where I was, that with the Americans on this first floor and me up in the, up above uh, on the side of a hill, uh, they, they weren't going to hang around there. Uh, that was perfect. Thank you, that story. You, yeah, you did great. Um, you're doing wonderful. Um, this is another general question. During your time in combat, did you have any experiences against snipers? Uh, snipers. Yeah, uh, only it was after the war, like I told you about the, the, the jails that we used to take care of, that there used to be a sniper. It, it was a young, Fellow, maybe I say young, maybe maybe he was eighteen or something, up a, in a house across the way from the the jail. Uh, but I I it wasn't I wasn't in the in the jail. The fellows that uh, in my platoon then were we occupied the these outlying small jail houses, and and. Um, this this young fellow up and across the way from used to fire through the window of the the jail, 
uh, and that was uh, that was after, after the war too. You just watch out for the wires. Um, oh. So that was so you don't remember any snipers during the actual fighting. No, I don't remember any snipers. At, no, no. Um, because we kept moving quite often. Did you during your whole time in combat? Did you have any experiences against mines or in minefields? Uh, yes, uh, Anzio. What happened? When we broke out of Anzio, I'm talking about all, all of the American forces. Uh, when we broke out of Anzio, there was a, like a cow road or something going north where we were going and we were riding in, in jeeps and uh, I, I always figured myself fortunate. Um, the jeep in front of me has four fellows in, in it and we had four fellows in ours and then there was um, another jeep behind us and then a one and a half ton truck that uh, carried the rest of the platoon and and they had four well the jeep in front we always kept you know maybe 20 30 yards apart we you know we didn't like tailgate or anything like that we kept separated and, and because we were breaking out of Anzio, we didn't know how far the Germans withdrew or anything like that. And as we we're going along, there was a huge explosion in front of us. And of course, when that happened, we dived out of our jeeps. Everybody did, and then and then out of the truck into a, a ditch just beside the road. If you call it a road, and and um, the jeep in front of us, we didn't find one single body. We didn't find hardly any of the jeep itself. They hit a mine that was set for a tank, and and it was set for a tank and it blew everybody and we did, you couldn't even find a body we didn't find a body we didn't look that much because the, we we had to keep uh we we went back to the point that we just left this spend the night there because this was it was near the end of the day this happened and um Of course, the, the, the lieutenant, Lieutenant Lafay, got on the phone and called the headquarters. Told him, and he was told to stay there. They're going to send a, a mine detector group, group there, and they did. And about uh, the next morning, around ten o'clock, we got word that it was all clear, and we headed towards Rome. We were headed towards Rome when we broke out of Anzio. I mean, that breakout, that was a lot of action. That was like uh, May 23rd. Do you, do you remember anything else about the breakout? Uh, no, the only thing I remember, is, um, I, I, I wasn't riding in a Jeep, I was riding in a one and a half ton truck in the back. And we were, we, they didn't want us in Rome because if four months on Anzio, we were, we 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 weren't that good looking, <laughs> and um, we uh, we were on the, uh, what they call the hills of Rome, that around Rome, and we could see the Colosseum and other big big buildings from the distance of where we were, but we went around Rome, the troops that paraded in Rome, worn in combat, they were all in their good uniforms and so forth to make an impression. 
but uh, we we went about fifty miles above Rome into um, some kind of a, uh, well, I was gonna say like an ap apple orchard or something. I I don't know what it was that they grew there. And there was a stucco house there, two stories, and they, they didn't have any running water, no, no uh, toilet facilities or anything like that. And we didn't even go in the house. The people were still living there. And, um, but on the way there, uh, I seen a, a water trough off on the field that served the water for all the neighborhood around here. I, I, didn't, I couldn't call it a neighborhood because I didn't see any more houses. But the water was running constantly uh, out into the trough and down the other end of the trough was a big flat rock. And being uh, where we were before we uh, got there. It's been a while since I had a bath or, or, or any of us did. And uh, so, so I said to one of the fellows, I, at, this is in Italy now, uh, so I was, I was a corporal. Uh, I, I says, I'm gonna go down to the kitchen, the mess hall, or the field hall. Field, uh, uh, and and I'm gonna ask him if he has any soap, because they had this orange soap that they use for pots, and pans. It was a big bar like that, and I'm gonna ask him for a piece of soap. And I'm gonna go back to that um, water trough I seen out in the field. It's about a mile and a half back, and so. We did that, and the, 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 the uh, mess sergeant there, he, he says, I'll, yeah, he says, I'll give you a half a bar, and he cut a bar in half and gave me one. And we, we went down there, the two of us, and not a soul around or anything, and, and, and out in this field. And he took off our clothes, and, and uh, oh, before we went there, we got uh, in our truck, the truck we had, it had clean underwear and a shirt and pants, to, and I I took them with, it. and um, <laughs> uh, we got in the the water uh, in the trough and washed it up and everything. We were there about twenty minutes and I heard singing. And I, I said, I said to the fellow, I forget who it was now, but I, I was just a corporal anyway. But uh, I said, do you hear singing? He said, yeah. He said, I hear singing. And so we look around, we still didn't see it. And then all of a sudden coming out of the woods were these four women with baskets of clothes over their heads and, and headed towards where we were. And I said, oh boy, <laughs> we're, we're naked in here. <laughs> and so they come, nod to us and big smiles on our face. And they were down where the flat rock was. And they uh, start washing clothes down there. And they had no soap. They were banging the clothes on the flat rock and hanging out. <laughs> We had this bar of soap. So, uh, the, the fellow with me, he says, what are we going to do? I says, well, I said, we're either going to sit here for a week or we're going to get up. <laughs> so we got up and dry, dried off and uh, I, we put our clothes on and I said, wait a minute. And I I went over and I gave this lady the bar of soap. You think I gave her a million dollars? They were ready to hug me, and, I, and of course I didn't want to get hugged. I just got cleaned. 
<laughs> and what they, they, I gave, we gave them the bar of soap, and they were in heaven with that bar of soap. And I don't know how long ago they ever seen a bar of soap. The things that we take for granted meant so much. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, yeah. thanks for that. Um, I just have a couple more general questions, and then we'll we'll finish. Okay. With, with the uh, what's it, Rottweiler? Oh, Reaper 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 I'll pronounce that right one of these days, but Reaper I just have a couple more general ones, and then we'll finish, because that's your major story. That's yeah. what makes you a hero, that, you know, you oh. rescued those men, or you tried to. Oh. So I just have a couple more general, but if you move your foot for me, just oh. why, okay. So, sir, um, okay. Uh, somebody there? No, I thought I, okay. Oh. So, Couple more general questions about your whole time in combat. What weapon did you personally carry? I carried, uh, let's see, an M1, a, a, a carbine, which I didn't like at all because uh, the spring in the carbine wasn't working right. There was, uh, 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 one of the fellows that was with me, uh, he had a carbine and he had his. Uh, uh, he had it on um, on a German soldier, and the German shoulder had his gun on him, and he pulled the trigger on the carbine, and it didn't go off, and the German shoulder shot him right through the uh, 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 shoulder here. Oh, what's his name? Uh, oh, I. Oh, God, I know his name. I, I'm losing everything. And, um, what happened to him? Uh, uh, he went to the hospital. I was a, I was a sergeant then, and uh, I, he went to the hospital. And he was a sergeant. We were both uh, squad leaders. Uh, Wainwright is his name. Yeah, R R Wainwright. Uh, he he. Went to the hospital, and when he come back, I was platoon sergeant then. We lost so many guys. And, and um, he, he, and I didn't know he, he, just, he was coming back, but he came back and he found where I was, and he, 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 said, he said, hey, Bernie. And I said, what's the matter? Uh, oh, God, was, I know his last name is Wainwright, but I, I forget his name. And um, I said, what's the matter? I said, welcome back. And he says, uh, oh, I got to move. <laughs> I keep moving. Uh, I said, what's, what's the matter? Walter, Walter Wainwright, that was it, Walter Wainwright. I said, what's the matter, Walter? He says, look, and he showed me his shoulder. And it was still zoos wet like, and he says that's that's where I got hit, and, and I I says oh um, he, he says uh, what do you think, I said I think you should go back to the medics, and tell them that I sent you back that you're not fit for combat. So we did, and that's what happened. They shipped him home. They should never have sent him back. He was oozing, you know, just out of, out of it. You were talking, though, about uh, the different weapons you personally carry. Oh. So the M1, the carbine. I had a 45. A 45. And, and I had um, the Tommy machine gun. I, I can't read a lot when I was becoming. But uh, during your time in combat, were there opportunities that you fired each of these, or was there? Uh, there wasn't a lot, but I did fire the, the, the Tommy machine gun, and um, uh, where, where I got hit with the grenade, I had it there. Um, you had fired it at the. I just fired it blank because I couldn't see it. It was uh, at dusk. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, 
and and of course in the woods. And so I, I just spray it in front of me. And, and um, the uh, the M1 I, I fired in Munich, Munich, Munich. No, not Munich, and and Nuremberg, Nuremberg. I didn't have to fire anything in Munich. What happened in Nuremberg? Uh, I was just a sniper in some building, so I just fired back at the at the windows in the building, and just uh, if you get fired like that, you're you're leaving it because they figure we know that he's up there and we're going to go get him. You know. Well. A lot of the veterans who I meet, you know, they talk about when you get in a firefight, often you're firing in a general area. Yeah. And many other people are firing, so you don't know who hit who. No. But, you know, other veterans talk about opportunities where you see the enemy in the clear and you can get a bead. Yeah. Uh, mean, most of your experiences, was it just a general area? Yeah. Uh, we didn't see a Germany like that. There was some... Um, uh, comic, uh, you know, I thought about it later, comic things. Uh, when we were headed into Germany, um, we got orders. I didn't have a, a lieutenant then either. I, was, I, I ran the platoon, I don't know, several months without a lieutenant. You, you could be 100 yards or 200 yards away but the, it all depends on what between you and him and uh, and so, and uh, it, it, what you have to be careful of is that while you're concentrating on him, somebody else over here or something is going to be looking for you. So, so it's uh, how do you how do you protect yourself if you have to expose yourself uh, to fire at the enemy? How do you protect yourself from getting hit? Well, you have to time your shots. <laughs> Uh, and in some cases they don't. You you, you will get, or it'd be very close, very close. And uh, uh, sure, um, you, you never know in, in the infantry. You never know which way somebody's shooting at you. And especially in in our predicament is that. We're advancing on them. Where you're, you're still, you're, you're hiding good, but we're advancing in the open. And there's, it's, it's a big difference, uh, advancing and holding, and, and because advancing you have to expose yourself, holding you're waiting for somebody to expose themselves. Uh, Thank you for sharing that. You know before. Besides Reipsweiler, uh, where you got into some close engagements with the Germans, besides there, your uh, whole time in combat, what would you say, wh where where was it that you got the closest to the enemy in a firefight? Where was that? Besides uh, Reipsweiler. Uh, uh, I, I would say uh, we had what, what they would call the Lost Battalion. There was two companies, well, where I, um, where I said uh, Matthias and, uh, uh, got shot in the woods. Uh, there's two companies that were surrounded and we were trying to break through into them. Uh, I, I was within 25 yards of a, 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 an enemy there, um, but I never seen him because he was dug in behind bushes, and I was in the opening of it, and um, that's where uh, the fella got shot in the legs, and Larry Mathiason was killed, Gordon was killed, because we were going. It was uphill. It was a mountain there, or a hill, I don't know if a mountain or a hill. Near the, uh, O'Brien? Who, who was the, who was the officer in the beginning? Sperm. It, well, it was O'Brien first. O'Brien oh. decided, that's the guy above Sparks. 
Oh, be, above Sparks. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, all right. So Brian decides to... Because my, my lieutenant was Lieutenant Lefebvre. And he's not mentioned there at all. Not at all. I read the whole thing. It yeah. He uh, was my, my, he's the one I reported to when I broke out down below and, and it, it went to Sparks. Really? Yeah. It doesn't mention him at all. No. You're going to have to include that. The, who's William Berg? He's he, he, a lieutenant that replaced Lefebvre. Af, after that happened, with the other companies were captured and so forth. After that all happened, they had to rearrange the whole battalion. And um, my lieutenant was Lefer. Uh, uh, he was made captain. He was the first lieutenant. Uh, he was made captain and sent to the anti-tank company. See, we were anti-tank platoon. He went to the company our head of the company, he left our outfit. Lieutenant Berg, I was, I was at least a month and a half to two months without a lieutenant. That's when you became kind of in charge. Yeah, and um, Lieutenant Berg took over uh, Le, Le, uh, Charles, Le, Charles Lafayette. Uh, he took over the anti-tank platoon. Lieutenant Berg did. But during this whole incident, did you have anything to do with Berg? No. So that's wrong then? Yeah, that's wrong because Berg wasn't in there at all. Unless he was somewhere in the company area or something like that. Because I don't know where he came from uh, after Lefebvre. When, when we pulled back... We pulled into a an old barn, you know, uh, you know in, in the back, and uh, I, I was laying on the ground on a straw in the, in the barn, and um, somebody from headquarters came in and got a hold of me. Oh, uh, that's when I got promoted to platoon sergeant because. Gordon was one of the ones that was killed. He was our platoon sergeant then. Gordon, he was killed in in the uh, advance there. But so when I was in there, this um, I think it was Buck Sergeant from the headquarters, uh, and uh, he says to me, you know, Sergeant Fleming, you're taking over the anti tank platoon. You're promoted to tech. That's when I got promoted to tech sergeant. Tech sergeant. But I, I and then I was in charge for uh, at least a month and a half before I had a lieutenant. And that was Berg. And that was Berg. And and I don't know how they they worked that, but he wasn't. He, he was a good lieutenant, but he wasn't there long. And, and he disappeared. And, and um, maybe two or three weeks later, I got another lieutenant. It was, which, um, oh, I forget his name. <laughs> I, 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 had, I had four lieutenants during the war. Uh, and uh, most of them came uh, Lafayette I had in uh, Italy, in southern France, and then uh, he he, uh, he got promoted after that as captain, and went to any tank company and to run that, and that's uh, and then I was without a lieutenant for a while. I got Berg, then Berg disappeared. And I got uh, an Irish name. Daily. Uh, huh? Daily. Daily. Da no. I thought you said daily earlier. Daily. Maybe a daily. Uh, isn't it? Uh, uh, anyways, uh, and and then 
after him. I got a different lieutenant, uh, Laments. Laments. Yeah, I, I had four, in, in a short period of time, I had four different lieutenants. Well, I'm surprised yeah. they didn't give you a commission. Well, I didn't want <laughs> No, I wouldn't get it. Uh, yeah. When you went after the war was over, then they wanted to, did they want to send you to officer candidate school? No. After the war was over, they did. They did? Yeah. Uh, but he, he had a family at the uh, time. So. I don't know. It, it took I, a lot of the back. Oh, I see. I was, in, I, was, I was in the reserves, uh, inactive reserves. They had an active reserve and inactive reserve. And when Korea happened, I got called back into the service. And Jimmy was the baby then. And uh, I was sent to Fort Hood, Texas. And uh, I, I, for training purposes, I was to train new recruits. Uh, and I, 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 of course, I didn't want to go, but I had a family and everything. And, but I figure when I joined for the inactive reserves, they wouldn't be calling me, they'd be calling the active reserves. <laughs> But they didn't call them. They called the inactive reserves. Sure, sure. <laughs> and so I was sent to um, Fort Hood, Texas. And I was down there for two, two weeks. Two weeks, two or three weeks. And I got called to an office down there. And never, uh, uh, I, had a, I had a room as big as this room here, just for myself. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I got, I got called to go to headquarters. So I went to headquarters, and I figured, well, here I go. I'm going to be moved out somewhere. And they said, "You're going home. The war is ending. We don't need you." So uh, that's. Uh, uh, after uh, uh, you know, I had to leave my job. I was a, a apprentice electrician, and I had my license, but I was a, still an apprentice. And uh, I, I come back and went to work for Hedinger. But uh, I, I I don't know. We were at Reaperswiler, and we got word that two of our Companies up on the hill were surrounded, and they had wounded. And they're running out of ammunition. And they had no food or water, and we received word to see if we could break through to get up to them. And we we started up a path. Uh, going up the hill, uh, uh, up the side of the mountain. And we got to a certain spot, uh, part. L Lieutenant Lefebvre gave the signal and they, we started making a line across to go up the mountain. We, so we, we, we walked up this far, single file, and he, we went across, and then we started up, and the Germans opened fire all along uh, the line that we were on. And uh, we were getting heavy fire, and we seen an indentation in the ground where a tree was. And I had the, the fellows that were near me all jump into the hole and get down and we open fire from there and um, then uh, Neff was up uh, 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 from another squad this is my squad in the hall uh, I he was shot in the legs and I went out and brought him back in the hall 
And uh, then other fellows start coming in. And I said, what's going on? And I said that uh, uh, our, uh, oh, God, what's his name? Um, our platoon sergeant was killed. Sergeant Wainwright, one of the squad leaders, he was shot through the shoulder. Uh, lieutenant gave the order to withdraw. I says, we didn't get no order to withdraw. And he says, well, everybody pulled back and two of the other fellows were hit. And then this, uh, and so I asked, uh, well, we're, we're stuck here in this hole. He got a machine gun on us. Um, uh, so I asked for a volunteer, and one, one of the fellows volunteered, and he got maybe oh, 15 yards from us when he got hit down. And um, so I, I told everybody to stay down, that I'm going for help. And I said, I have to, I go out and see what, uh, as I w ran out down, it was, um, I came across Larry Matthias. I, uh, I'm using his name, uh, but uh, I came across Larry, and, and he was like sitting there. And I said, Larry, get up and move. And I, I went over and s to see him, and he was dead. So I continued on down to, uh, and I come across Lieutenant, no, I come across George Welgus and his squad that was down the, the hill more and had a skirmish line across. And I says, what's going on to George? And he says, uh, he says, we're forming a line here. I said, where's the lieutenant? He says, uh, down for a little further down. He said, so I went down, I seen Lieutenant Lafayette, and I told him what's going on. I had trapped men up the path. And uh, so he says, well, he said, we'll tell Sparks and see what he says. So Sparks was told and Sparks ran out, he got on the back of a scout vehicle. It's a, a, a small tank with a 37 millimeter gun on it. And he stood on the back of the tank and rode up to the where the, the men were uh, in the hole, hopped off the tank, carried the uh, wounded guys and put them on the back of the tank and the tank uh, was firing all the time so the Germans weren't firing at us. And uh, the, uh, everybody got back down that was in that hole. And uh, then we found one more fellow, I, 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 I found him, he was walking in the days up the hill. He was shot through the upper part of his leg and he was just in shock. He didn't know where he was or what he was doing. So I brought him back down and sent, sent him with another fella to the medics. And that's the story there. You talked about going up the hill uh, in a single file and then you guys spread out. Yeah. What kind of fire were you guys taking on from the Germans? We, we, we didn't take anything on until we spread out across and then we started up and that's when the firing started. We, we, we went up there uh, pretty easily, really. And... Uh, uh, my, my squad was the last one in line going up. That's how come we were on this side. Um, 
And so I wanted to know, you know, was it just machine gun fire as you guys were going up the hill? Yeah, it was just one uh, one man with a machine gun that was up on that hill that I know of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I mean, can you talk about the conditions? What were the conditions like weather-wise? Weather-wise, it was all right. It was good weather. Uh, but you're, you're in, it, it was a lot of uh, overgrow, uh, trees and uh, uh, bushes, like that. So yeah. you, you couldn't see the enemy, you just... I couldn't see it, no. And they couldn't see you, I guess. Oh, well, they could see us, you know, because we have to stand up. They're hiding behind bushes. Uh, was there snow everywhere? No snow. Okay. No okay, snow. so thank you for explaining that. So you get to, to the, you're under fire, and you see this hole. Yeah. Was it literally a tree had fallen down, and the hole was there? Yeah. Uh, uh, I will say this. Uh, uh, I mean, it has nothing to German and French force, uh, forces were very clear. You, you couldn't cut a tree down unless it was approved by the, the government in, in Germany. Uh, and the people didn't have oil burners or anything like that. They burned wood. So the people used to go out and pick up these branches after a storm and like that, but they had to have approval from the government in order to do it. So when a tree fell down or anything like that, everybody was out chopping that tree up to get the, because that's what they used in their, heat their house and um, uh, for cooking, every, everything. Everybody was, the, the, they, they had nothing but, they didn't have coal. They, they just burned wood. So any, uh, their, their force was very clean as far as broken branches and things like that. Uh, and, and nobody could cut a tree down unless the government marked it that, that it could be cut down. Uh, it, it, they were very, very clear very clean, you might say, force. So that was a very lucky thing. Yeah, oh, it was. Uh, uh, it was. It was a huge tree that was there. Uh, I, I never seen it because it was all chopped up then, but the, the hole was still there, that, where the tree was. And how, how deep would you say that hole went? Uh, it wasn't too deep. Uh, I, maybe four feet. And how wide? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I would say as wet as this room. I, 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 I wouldn't even say that this way here, this way. So you guys had to keep down. Well, we had to keep down, yeah. Yeah, uh, so in the story that you just mentioned, though, you, you said it that Neff was hit before you asked for volunteers to go is that right? Oh, yeah. In your uh, memory, that's what happened. Yeah. So Neff is hit. Where was Neff hit? And, and around the ankles, mostly, because around the lower part of his legs, anyway. And so once he gets hit, what do you do? Well, uh, I, I pull him back to the hole. How far uh, was he? Uh, 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 a little longer than the room here. Yeah. I, I, I really can't remember uh, because I didn't go by that. But you were uh, on the fire, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, and uh, I, when I went to see Larry Matthias, you, you know, the one that was killed, Larry, when I was standing there, I had bullet, bullet holes through my, the loose part of my, pants, uh, they, they fired at me, but uh, uh, j just with fra fractions of an inch or something, they missed my legs. They, they went right through my pants, like, 
Uh-huh. So, you know, you, you get in the hole, you drag in Neff, and you mention a couple other men from different uh, 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 yeah. You said they were wounded. Uh, how, how did you no, no, they weren't wounded. They just just came in uh, uh, because I asked them because the lieutenant gave the word to withdraw, but it the word never came t- to me or anyone in my square. We were down on the left hand side of the. And, but everybody up there, at, and the fellows that came in the hole came from uh, it, it, from his his side. Um, uh, they come in, and I said, and, and I asked them. I said, "How come you left your squad? Or, or, or what are you doing here?" And they said, the "Lieutenant gave us orders to withdraw." I said, "How come we didn't? We didn't get the order." And it wouldn't do any good anyway. They wasn't going to leave the wounded there. And so uh, I said, okay. I said, stay down. I said, that whoever is up there is firing at us as soon as you put your head up. And, and so then you mentioned that you asked for volunteers. What did you want the volunteer uh, to do? Uh, oh, to, to go and, and uh, notify that we were trapped, and uh, the the one volunteer that went was shot. He didn't get very far. What was his name? Larry Matthias. And and tell me, what what kind of person was he? Uh, well, he wasn't in in the outfit too long. Larry wasn't, but uh, he was a very nice man, big man. He's a big man, and. Uh, he volunteered to go, and he didn't get yet too far, and I, so I, I didn't want anyone else to go. So I told him I'm going to stay down. And I went and told Lieutenant Lafay how I had trapped men up there. What was that distance? Would you say from the hole to to where you to where your lieutenant was? Oh, I have no idea because I, I, uh, I didn't run straight down to him. I, I ran across and zigzagged down, and uh, I actually I came to George Welgus, uh, his squad first, and uh, I says, George, I says, where's the lieutenant? He says, down there, and he pointed to down further, maybe about. 10, 15 yards more. I mean, Mr. Fleming, you, you had just seen one of your uh, fellow platoon members volunteer and get killed, killed by machine gun fire. Yeah. And, you know, after making it 10 yards. And now you're, you're telling yourself that you can't ask anyone else to go. I mean, what's going on in your head, sir? I mean, you're you're about to put yourself in a very uh, vulnerable position where you know you could get killed. Oh well, anyone there could get killed. Anyone in the infantry can get killed. And if we stayed there, we were all going to get killed. And we had wounded guys, men there, guys there. There was wounded guys and some healthy guys. And they, um, being in the outfit so long, these are all new fellas, you know, uh, replacements. And uh, they never had to go in, uh, against anything like this or see, see anything like it. Uh, some of them probably were in the outfit maybe two or three weeks. And, and so, uh, they're scared stiff, uh, and I, I don't blame them. I was scared myself, but you, you can't let anyone see you're scared because you're the leader. <laughs> and um, but uh, it's a it's a g- gamble, really. It, it is a gamble. It's uh, you're you're hoping 
somebody's is firing at you, their gun misfires or something, any, anything. Uh, you just hope, uh, or you catch them off guard. I mean, it just takes a lot of bravery to know that you're about to do something dangerous, but still go ahead and do it. Uh, uh, well, it, uh, you have to, uh, uh, in, a, in a way, or you shouldn't be in charge. I, I wouldn't ask somebody to do something that I wouldn't do. And, and uh, of course, anyone in charge is in charge of them too, and do the best you can to protect them. Uh, you're not going to send them out and say, go out and get that guy out there, you know, and hope that he gets them before he, he is shot. Because you're sending somebody out that could get killed. And you yourself is just staying back to be, play it safe. You, you can't do that and, and control. Thank you for explaining that. You know, you mentioned as you went out, uh, you went to check on Lawrence. Uh, uh, Larry. Larry. Uh, yeah. You went to check on him. I mean, did you actually, from the hole, when, when he volunteered to go first, did you guys watch him, then you saw him fall? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, the other fellows, I made them keep down. But I watched how Larry went, and I, I see him go down, but I thought he was wounded because he went down and just, like, sat. He didn't lay down or fall down like it's in a, the movies or anything like that. He just sat down like it was a regular sitting down. And uh, when, I, when I got up to him, I, I said, Larry, come on, come on. And I, I touched him, and he was dead. Do you remember where he was hit? No, I don't. No, I because I, you know, he got hit. He'd be bleeding inside his clothes. I didn't know where he got hit. And and as as you went, when you went to go check up on him, I mean, you're under fire the whole time. Yeah. That must have felt like an eternity, you know, being in the open. Did you? Had, well, you blocked it out, or do you uh, remember uh, the bullets going off around you? Uh, no, uh, the only thing I remember is the, the ones going around my legs. It, it was firing, was firing low. But um, you, you don't, uh, I, it's hard to explain, but you, you don't think of yourself. I was thinking of Larry, uh, I wanted to, if he was wounded, I was going to take him back to the hole, or, but he was dead, and uh, I, so I continue on down. And did you come back with Sparks? No, he he wouldn't let me. But you wanted to. Yeah, but Sparks didn't. Go, uh, Sparks was on because he was on a, a, a scout car. It was a scout car built like a tank with a thirty-seven millimeter gun on it. They used to come out, uh, run ahead, of, ahead of, sometimes ahead of a company that, like when we hit southern France, we, we didn't run into the enemy troops maybe for a mile or two. But, so they used to send the scout cars out to find out where the next German offense, uh, defense, defense is. And uh, we, we were also, uh, not not the whole, we were part of, I don't know if you ever heard of Butler's, uh, 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 <coughs> Army, Butler's Army. It was made up of all different units. And it was uh, one of these army, uh, armies that, that pushes through, looking for the enemy. And we were we were assigned to them, and we rode on tanks, on the outside of the tanks. And uh, whenever there was a firing, we hop off the tank as a group would go. It was scattered fire, really, in southern France. And, and uh, 
when the, uh, the area was clear, cleared or if there was a big firing, we went beyond them and they radioed to the units that were in, coming up behind us that, you know, where the fire, heavy firing was. And, uh, and we would leave the, the heavy firing. We, I don't know how, it was Butler's Task Force. They call it after General Butler. Larry, Larry Mathias had, had a little baby girl that he had never seen. And he was killed. Do you remember him uh, talking about the baby? No, no, because it, we, we never talked about the, things like that. Uh, uh, although he, he, he uh, had a picture of her, yeah, you know, like that, but uh, we never talked about families. Uh, uh, my name is Bernard Fleming. I'm going to read my citations for the Bronze Star. Go ahead, please. Uh, under the provisions of Army Regulation 400-45, as amended, a, a House uh, Star Medal is awarded. Oh, uh, a house bronze medal is a st awarded to each of the following enlisted men. Bernard Fleming, serial number 3128-6826, Infantry Technical Sergeant. Uh, you, you want these other ones? No, just you. Uh, that, well, that's just me. That's it. Now keep going because it explains what happened. Sergeant, uh, Headquarters Company, 3rd Battalion, 157th Infantry Regiment, were medal achieved in action on Jan 18th January 1945 near Reapers uh, Wilder, uh, France. When this, when his squad was pinned down by heavy enemy machine gun f and rifle fire, Sergeant Fleming stripped down to to his rifle and belt and had dashed 100 yards across open territory to the platoon command post where he received the necessary help to overcover his squads with a uh, draw to another position because of the uh, Marcos was superior of too many forces. Sergeant Fleming uh, action undoubtedly saved the lives of many men in his squad. Uh, before, uh, before. Uh, Tried the military service from spring. Oh. Oh, oh, wait, now I see. Entered the military service of Springfield, Massachusetts. That's it. Do you remember the ceremony of when you got the award? <coughs> there, there was no ceremony. They just gave it to you? Yeah. Actually, I I didn't get the award until I got home. What advice do you want to give to future generations, Mr. Fleming? What advice? Well, I would say treat each other as you would like to be treated. Oh, shoot. I'm, Mr. Fleming, just say that one more time. Tr treat treat each other 
as you would like to be treated. What would you want to say to the men who were killed in the war? What would you want them to know? So now, uh, I like them to know that they are not forgotten and that they made a better world for a while. That's beautiful. Uh, what kind of person do you want your friends and family to always think of you as? As what kind of man? Oh. Uh, a kind man. If I was kind, I think if I... I would kind to all my family and my uh, their husbands. Uh, I, 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 if you're kind to everybody, uh, you, you get the same reward back. I'm the same age that you were when you were in combat. If you were to give me some advice for my life, what, what would you tell me? For, for your life? Oh, God. Just general life advice. Just treat people the way you want to be treated. That's all. That's all I ever wanted uh, anyone to. Uh, you don't have to be treated bad or, or treat someone bad. You can. Uh, That's a, hmm. And what can future generations do to make the sacrifices of your generation worth it? Well, uh, not to be jealous of of other people if they have something that you don't have because they probably earned it and uh, and be caring of other people. No, that's perfect. And my personal last thing, sir, when you read that citation, it was interesting because I didn't think about it, but it mentions that you, when you were in that hole and you were going to make it yourself to go to the CP, you, you were, you had, you know, you had your gear and you had your weapon. Yeah. What, what was the reason you took those? You took them off, right? All right. I, 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 make it lighter. It's it's hard to run with a a belt loaded with ammunition and cartridges, and 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 they can't carry a a rifle running through a trees and everything. Uh, I try to make my uh, body less heavy <laughs> so I could run faster. So you just took off all the gear? Uh, I did. Including uh, your weapon? Yeah. So you, you were completely uh, with... I, uh, compl I, I did have um, a, a knife. I have a, a small, like a dagger. Uh, I'm sure the knife yeah. would come in handy against yeah, a machine yeah. gun. Well, uh, I was running away from it. I wasn't <laughs> running towards it. Fair enough. Yeah.